It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Andy, Renee, and Alex are here to talk about the Apple earnings report. We don't know the numbers yet, but we'll uh, give you something to look for. We'll also talk about the Apple Watch. It's due any minute now. And updates, updates, updates for iOS and OS X. I'll tell you what's new next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 439, recorded Tuesday, January 27th, 2015. Don't drink and drone. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by LegalZoom. Visit LegalZoom.com to save on your legal needs and gain access to a network of legal plan attorneys for guidance. LegalZoom is not a law firm, but provides self-help services at your specific direction. Visit LegalZoom.com and use offer code MBW to get $10 off at checkout. And by Audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, go to Audible.com slash MacBreak. And by... Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price. Because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash MacBreak and using the promo code MacBreak. It's time for MacBreak Weekly, the show where we cover all the latest Mac news. Of course, this week, you know, I'm, I'm thinking we blew it. We should have just uh, flip-flopped with Steve Gibson. Because the big Mac news, as every quarter, will come out after the market closes. Apple's earnings. We'll talk about it in a second. At least we can give you some predictions. Andy Anako is here from the Chicago Sun-Times. Great to have you, Andrew. Look at that. Thank you know, you. We got Snowmageddon out the back. Yeah, and I was I, I planned to do this anyway, but I was expecting it to still be the, the original forecast was that it's gonna it was going to still be like hammering down, hammering down, hammering down until like late afternoon. So I thought, okay, well, if I'm going to be like you know Jack Nicholson at the end of The Shining, at least let's get a podcast out of it. But it's actually <laughs> it's it was it was actually so it's it's tamed down so much that as of an hour ago, we actually had like like kid neighborhood kids like in my backyard like sledding. So <laughs> wow, looks good. That's pretty. It looks like the scene in White Christmas where uh, they uh, they haven't had snow in Vermont all season, and they at the end of the play in White Christmas they open the back of the barn and it's snowing. And I'm Bing just sorry I don't have the Santa Claus leisure suit that Bing Crosby was wearing <laughs> Bing Crosby. for that final scene. Exactly right. <laughs> also with us, uh, Mr. Rene Ritchie from Montreal, where snow is just a way of life. We left the back door open again. I'm so sorry about that, Andy. So, so sorry. <laughs> He's hunkered down as usual. That's okay because okay four more hockey players snuck in through the back door while you had it open. So. <laughs> Please, close the back door. Uh, Renee is at imore.com. And also, I'm glad to see uh, joining us from Washington, D.C., uh, where I understand he just uh, last night flew a DJI Phantom <laughs> drone into the that. White House grounds. Alex Lindsay of the Pixel Corps. I no, I I had nothing to do with that. I just want to say for the record, at least no one, at least no one can prove it. That's all. <laughs> that is the strangest story because uh, uh, it was apparently a government employee who uh, flew at two in the morning was recreationally flying his DJI Phantom. But the best thing is this snapshot from the Secret Service. The sh the f the Secret Service showed the drone that crashed on the south lawn. It's a DJI Phantom. I recognize well, that drone. And, and I think the technical term now is former government employee. <laughs> <laughs> they say that he's facing no charges. I don't, I don't know if facing no charges and getting fired are two very different that's things. That's true. But, you know, it, also, I mean, you, thought, you, thought, you thought it was difficult getting your Frisbee back from the old man next door. You're not getting your <laughs> crap back from those guys. <laughs> I have some sympathy because I got my first uh, drone uh, a couple of days ago. We're going to have a drone lesson with Father Robert Ballester Wednesday afternoon mm -hmm. after... Uh, this week in Google, by the way, you're all invited, uh, and we're going to do it indoors. But I thought I'd get ready, so I got my uh, my my SEMA, and I got it all ready. And my back, you know, we have some we have some space out there, so I went out back, turned it on, went goes up and I'm and up and up and up. It's like a helium balloon. I can't get it to move or go down. It just goes straight out of eyesight, straight up, <laughs> and that was it. I never saw it again. <laughs> so. I think I was looking closely to see if this was a SEMA. 
because I thought maybe it ended up in the White House lawn, but no. Isn't that hysterical? There's got, there's got as these schemes become more sophisticated and more like expensive. There's got to be someone figuring out how to like have a second controller somewhere that can override yours and just have it like land inside the back of your van and then you drive away with it. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's too small to be picked up by the radar apparently that's protecting the White House. White House is right. The reason I thought of this is right behind Alex. You could easily fly a drone over there. Yes, yes. No. It, well, I'm, I'm actually surprised it didn't happen. Uh, it didn't happen sooner. You know, when you think about the how many people are using drones, that something didn't end up in the White House lawn. It yeah, seems like yeah. a good place to to shoot. Of course, Especially, everyone's afraid of the guys on the top of the roof. You know, that's the. Yeah. I think that that might be what's slowing them down. Uh, the Secret Service agent who was posted on the south grounds of the White House heard and observed the drone, but they were unable to bring it down. <laughs> I wonder if there was some shooting before it passed over the White House fence and struck a tree <laughs> the, the drone was too small and flying too low to be detected by a radar and could easily have been confused by for a large bird <laughs> the uh, agency said the employee a government employee not identified by the secret service was flying the object near the white house around 3 a.m for recreational purposes <laughs> when he lost control of it officials did not explain why the man who does not work at the white house and who has not been charged with a crime was flying the drone at that hour for the lulls. <laughs> For the lulls. But it actually it's a very serious thing because uh, that drone could have a payload. I mean, it, it's not, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it is serious. It's just, we live in a, in a strange age. That was on We're one of those shows. Someone 3D prints a drone and then sends it on a nefarious mission. Right. It could happen. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> that's so much easier than just buying one. <laughs> well, they're going to start monitoring it's, it's, the drones, Andy. The printer is. That's right. Still... If you print it, you can print it safely. <laughs> well, they, yeah. then they monitor the servos. <laughs> Here's an article in dig.com. I don't I haven't even read the article, but I like the the headline Do not strap Roman candles to your drone is the headline. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is there God. a lesson learned video? Uh, yeah, There's there is after video. this uh, commercial in three, two, or, or, or do one. it because then because you're an idiot who shouldn't have a drone and then you won't have a drone anymore. So I <laughs> totally underscore <laughs> uh, <laughs> But don't you aren't you tempted to strap Roman candles? Candles. There are the drones. <laughs> to your drone. Not a, the anything drone. that costs more than thirteen dollars that I paid for. Uh, oh, those are God. Roman candles. This can only end poorly. That's the kind of thing Alex Lindsay would do. This looks like episode one footage. Lasers. I I, I I'm really into lasers. Whoa! He's Whoa. shooting at him. He's, that's that's well played. That's a weaponized drone. Oh my God! This is no terrible. guidance. No guidance package at all. <laughs> I know, yeah, exactly. Oh, it gets him and in the, the head. It's good he's wearing a helmet. Oh. oh ah. ah, bad words. <laughs> Does this end in a Darwin Award? I just I, it ahead. feels like this really ought to. How, how do you get remote-controlled Roman candles? That's what I'd like to know. Or is he just waiting? Hard. <laughs> <laughs> All you get... <laughs> <laughs> he did not watch enough Wile E. Coyote as a child. <laughs> I'm sorry. It does. It it is great with the like little, what what appears to be kind of like a tracer action going yeah. on. Yeah, so I mean, it uh, looks like uh, it looks like a gunship. It's good. It's good. Uh, it's good video. I I am kind of uh, disappointed that I didn't do Think that. Think of first. that. I know this is an Alex mm -hmm. Lindsay right there. This this this, this pretty much is a, 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 fl a flavor of my childhood. Who are you gonna get though? Your, your kid brother, obviously. Oh, it's always the younger there. brother. It's the younger brother. <laughs> And, 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 and usually and usually it has something to do with you get to watch your movie first. Right. Okay, but you get to wear the helmet while I come at you with a drone armed with Roman candles. And, 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 but it has to be backed up with something that's something related to, I don't even think this is going to work. Yeah, right. Don't worry. <laughs> You're safe. But just in case, wear this helmet. <laughs> All right, later today, Apple's quarterly earnings will uh, come out. These, uh, these are the, these are the uh, big ones, right? The, uh, the holiday yep. quarter. Q1 2015. Q1, first earnings of the year, but because uh, Apple has a fiscal year that does not correspond to the calendar year. You know, it's almost always a blowout in Q1. Um, Apple, uh, now you said, Renee, last time we talked that Apple no longer sandbags the analysts with uh, uh, lower than expectations than they really have. Well, I, I guess you can call it sandbagging or you can call it being conservative with your estimates. And they came from a long tradition of not performing well. So they they had a habit of being super conservative. <laughs> so Apple and then told they Wall Street they were making money. Apple told Wall Street to expect, expect total sales uh, growth of 15% from 63 
and a half to 66 and a half billion, somewhere in that range. Uh, Which I think is pretty amazing when you think about it. Like for them to look out a quarter, um, I, I, I don't even know what I'm going to make in, you know, two months from now, a month from now. And so right. I always look at it like for them to be able to accurately say within, you know, six or eight percent, it's pretty, it's, you know, for a consumer product, you know, that you're releasing, you don't know how it's going to be taken. You don't know all those things for them to make those models is actually pretty interesting. And this is an interesting graph. This is from Fortune magazine where they show. Uh, revenue projected by, well, Apple's guidance, uh, that's the white dots, the amateurs, I don't know who those are, that's the green dots, the pros, that's the blue dots, and the actual is the yellow bar. And this, Probably really smart people who don't happen to work for a financial institution yeah. at this point, like the Horace Dedios and the... Those and are the Aaron's amateurs, and yeah, okay. and, yeah. yeah. I would call Horace a pro, much more, frankly, <laughs> reliable than some of the Gartner Group folks, but okay. Um, so, uh, it's but as you, it, it's kind of as you pointed out, Renee, it's been pretty close... Apple's guidance has actually been uh, pretty close to the actual results. Yeah, and they switched to no longer deferring as much income as they used to, which has made right. it easier for people to understand. Well, not that they don't defer it, but they, re they report the non-GAAP right. uh, numbers as well now, so it's easier to understand. Last quarter, though, they did they were pretty low. They low-balled it. So we'll, uh, we'll see what... Uh, uh, is, this, is there anything to look for in the quarterly results when they come out? They'll be out in about an hour and a half iPad numbers. I mean, that's a lot of media. If they break those out, right? Numbers. right? They usually do. They traditionally do. They haven't not broken them out ever yeah. before. And it would be kind of odd if they didn't. Uh, also, how much the iPhone. One of the big questions with the iPhone is how many can they make? It's not how many they can sell anymore. But I believe last quarter they, they were constrained not by how many people bought, but how many they could physically produce. And that lowered the number from what, you know, I think it was from 70 down to 50 uh, based on the projections. Hmm. That's, that's that makes sense, though, because it's, it's, it's still really they sell every one they can make. Yeah. At this point, you don't see anywhere with, oh, we got, we're blowing them out to the bare walls. Hundreds of iPhones in the back. I love Philip's remark at the bottom there where he says that Apple's quarters are now as big as the only companies that can compete with Apple quarter wise are oligopoly companies that control fossil fuel resources. And even then, only the top two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. Well, and, and we're still looking at, um, I don't know whether it'll be this quarter or not, but we're still looking at a, a whole new brand, I mean, a whole new product line coming out uh, in this quarter. So I think that, you know, th they definitely are going to be, and there's a lot of possibilities, whether it's updates to the Apple TV, updates to the iPad, up, you know, there's so many things that are sitting out in front of them that it, this, this year doesn't look like it's going to slow down. Right. Uh, get ready for the big one, says business. That was Philip Elmer DeWitt. The, this is uh, Jay Yarrow. Get ready for the big one. He has, interestingly, the same picture of, uh, of uh, Tim Cook uh, signaling a touchdown, apparently. There's a couple publications that can go from doom to triumphant so quickly <laughs> back and forth that you really have to Apple's remember over. Apple's uh, winning. Apple's, yeah. I hate the iPhone. I love the iPhone. Yeah. Um, so before PM Eastern, so we're about an hour and a half, you know, if we'd really draw this out, we might be able to get to the earnings. They usually release it, um, uh, in, on pay, you know, a press release beforehand. So we might have one thirty uh, Pacific. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe we won't make it. Well, it'll happen during security now. Next, next uh, quarter, I'll flip flop. Uh, clearly, uh, clearly we, I mean, so the, that's the thing to watch. iPad sales, they've been tailing off. To, it, will this be yet another slow quarter for iPad sales? That'll be important uh, to watch. Uh, but by the way, it's, it's about, um, just in case you're wondering, uh, about $25,000 a second. Is that how much they make? Uh, that's, that's what it Revenue? Like. You just did the yeah. math? I just did the math. <laughs> I didn't do it. I did not do it in my head. $25,000 a second. Another $25,000. Another $25,000. Oh, <laughs> my God. Yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty Not amazing. Shabby. It's a good business model. That's all I'm saying. Um, do you think we'll look for a, a, a big Mac quarter? There wasn't. There weren't really new Macs. Uh, Retina 5K iMac, the new Mac. Oh, Mini. I forgot the iMac and the new Mac Mini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And quickly. I think the laptops are still going to be popular. So it might be a big quarter for the Mac. I bet that iMac, uh, the 5K iMac, sold well. Mm. But do Although desktops the really? Prices. But do, do desktops really have the the ability to move that kind of profit now? Now that you're chasing no. against. Products that sell in the millions and still make that forty percent, forty percent profit margin. It's iPhone, it's, iPhone, iPhone, isn't it? Well, I mean, it? I think that really, I mean, with the, I mean, I know they used to say that the Apple TV was a hobby, but I think that the desktops are getting to be pretty close to a hobby. No, don't say it. Shut your <laughs> mouth. Just saying. I'm just. Oh saying, no, I'm you didn't. 
<laughs> I have a lot of them. You know, it's like I have, I have a big investment in that hobby. Don't but say I'm that. Just saying that it's when you look at the when you look at it. I mean, if, if they stop making desktops, uh, it would go down a little, but not much. You but know, it would still and so be a huge I, I think business if someone just made Macs, which is the crazy thing. Right. Yeah. That's yeah, a good point. Exactly. A, a good and yeah. growing business. Right. If, yes. if all it was was Macs. Right. It only doesn't seem so important based because of the iPhone's huge success. Such a show off, overshadowing the poor Mac. It's just it can't look get at me. Light. Look at can't me. That's all. Love. <laughs> now I'm bigger. Look at me. Um, Unix in your pocket. Fa da da. So uh, let's talk about the future. Uh, stronger rumors now, uh, based on a Apple patent filing for a pressure sensitive pen, that Apple might be doing a uh, iPad Pro 12.9 inch iPad. Uh, with a touch-sensitive pen, perhaps as an add-on or maybe included. Uh, I, I'd love to see one that really works. I mean, I, I think I have half the pens that they make for the iPad, trying to get really the right solution that would solve that. And number one is it'd be great to have it be something that works OS-wide. You know, a lot of these pens are only work with this application or that application. Um, and also, they're all a little wonky. You know, they're not, you know, they're, they're none of them really work the way you want a pressure-sensitive pen to work, in my opinion. So I, I, having Apple integrate something, I think, would be great. Not not great for Wacom, but... Uh, but, but well, maybe great for Wacom because, you know, the, the Galaxy Note uses a Wacom digitizer. Right. And it might be that Apple... Well, is that the kind of thing Apple would do, or would they just make their own? I well, think they, they make technology. their own. I, mean, I think that I think that they're also trying to solve a different problem. I don't think that they need to have 1024 or 2048 levels of, of sensitivity. I think that you know the old fashioned 256 or 128 is probably enough. I mean, most of the time, what I do with my Wacom is actually not much art. It's actually marking up drawings or marking up plans and so on and so forth. And I think that there's a lot of utility there that you know it doesn't have to be an art program um, to be useful. Yeah. It depends on what uh, on how they try to sell it. I think there are two different ways to have a pen on a tablet. One is to do stuff that you're talking about, where people just want to be able to mark st something up and annotate things, which is incredibly useful. I'm uh, doing, uh, I've, I'm uh, working with somebody designing book covers for something I'm working on, and I'm about to like just put this into my drawing app and do, you know, and, and just like <laughs> use the mouse to add stuff. But then, so, oh well, actually, I have like this. I when I just open this in my iPad, use PDF Pen and just draw and just that's this is done in like five seconds and intuitively. So that is an important thing uh, as well as using it as a note taker. But I think that there's so many people who are, who are artists who use the uh, the Mac on on, uh, on a professional basis that. It'd be interesting to see if Apple really wants to make sure that those people are really, really happy. If this is the most profoundly useful and transformative art tablet that's ever, that's ever been put in the market, they do like to do things like in uh, in in superlatives, you know, where they can really justify that line in the keynote. We really think this is the best pen-based tablet that's ever been made. And with all the art programs that are available for the for the Mac right now, and uh, even on the iPad, they could really do that. I, I actually was kind of uh, poo-pooed this idea of a 12-inch of a iPad until the stylus rumor. And then I thought, oh, this is something, you know, Penny Arcade, Ar you know, the Oatmeal. All these guys are just going to flip their lids and say, oh, finally I could do my cartoons on an iPad. I think that would be a my, uh, huge product. My friend Mark Edwards, who runs Bajango, uh, he's a really well-known iOS designer. He has been petitioning for the largest iPad he could get. He would like yeah. a 120-inch iPad to just use as his easel <laughs> if he could get it. There's huge <laughs> demand in artistic and design communities. He should get we the saw Surface Microsoft Hub, speak. the new Surface yeah, this, Hub. We saw, I, I think he's trying to fit that on his wall right now. I mean, there's, <laughs> there is huge yeah. demand for large multi-touch services in many industries. It's a 55 or 84-inch screen uh, from a company that Microsoft bought called Perceptive Pixel that runs Windows 10. So it's And not infrared-based anymore. No. Big, big improvement there. Yeah. Yeah, that was a terrible solution. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at this uh, mock-up from Mac Rumors <clears throat> that would give you some idea of the size. So the, on the left is an iPad mini, then a slightly bigger an iPad Air 2, and then a whole lot bigger an iPad yeah. Pro. I mean, that's a big it's, jump. Well, and I think that the bezel would probably get... I think the bezel would get smaller. Yeah, that's one way to make it uh, not such a big jump. Oh, that's the, the last thing you'd want to do is have a big tablet with a small bezel, unless they unless they've really improved their 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 palm rejection and the uh, algorithms uh, to to a higher degree. The bigger a device gets, you, you don't get you don't have the ability to hold it like this anymore. You really do now have to yeah, hold it like point. this. You need and you'll ears anyway. Bonkers. Yeah. 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 But Apple really has to start differentiating the difference between the difference between the, the iPad Mini and the iPad Air now because it's I, I still have problems trying to advise people on why would you want to get the 9.7 inch instead of the Mini when the Mini is not that 
much smaller. It's not that much more convenient. The 9.7 is a lot more expensive. It runs the exact same software with, with the exact same user interface. Oh, wow. It's not, Look at the snow behind you. It's... We got a little yeah. It's, we, we're getting a little bit of, kicking up uh, there. Whew. I think I think that's just uh, snow being uh, oh, tossed around. Uh, around the AT Walker behind him too. <laughs> it looks <Yes>. like it. <laughs> Be better if you, I still I still have that uh, that Empire Strikes Back like banner that uh, a friend of mine gave me. That's the that was used in like an interview with uh, at Lucasfilm, and I just couldn't. I I, I figure why well, this is ha this is higher resolution and a lot less it's trouble for me. And you're not go from the planet Hoth tonight. If you if you look at what Apple's doing, like the Apple, there's an argument that could be made that the Apple Watch is going to allow for larger phones, like the iPhone 6 Plus, which is going to allow for larger tablets. Wait and a minute, why? Uh, so because if you have a, a watch on, you can look at your notifications. You don't have to take your phone out of your pocket or your purse as much. So the ability to, to quickly move it around doesn't become as much of an issue. Then if you have a larger screen phone, an iPad mini, like Andy said, doesn't make as much sense. You already have a small, large screen. Right. But maybe an iPad makes more sense at home for video and, and web and all these things. And then as you increase, so as the sizes increase, the sizes of the other things can increase proportionately. And you have technologies like handoff, where if something is too, you get a notification on your watch, but it's too finicky, so you just hand it off to your phone. You're trying to do it on your phone, but the email's taking too long to type. You hand it off to your Mac or to your iPad. And if you look at the iPad Air 2, which already has two gigabytes of RAM, three cores, eight graphics cores, yeah. and is thinner and lighter than last year, if you extrapolate that, I think, you know, Apple is impossible to predict, but really easy to look back at patterns. I think we're getting these things so that when an iPad Pro comes out, it is is light enough that it's not going to be a burden and it's powerful enough that it can start running these side-by-side -side apps. And I don't know about you, but ever since I had cards on WebOS, the idea of, of multiple windows was nice, but I couldn't do anything with it. Right. But if I could start dragging and dropping, like I could pick up Leo's name in this app, mm -hmm. drag it to that app, drag a picture back to the other app, then Multistar starts to become an interesting multi-window environment. Yeah, that, that's another another underscore for the for the 12-inch iPad. That uh, it's That is the... Uh, the Air 2 is suspiciously powerful for the apps that it runs. I mean, it runs it runs some nice apps and it runs them more more quickly than the the original iPad Air did, but it isn't a transformative difference. And that's that's why I say suspiciously. It's like it seems as though again, never you 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 you, you don't stare into the face of the Sphinx, you will be driven <laughs> mad. But if you try to look at that and think it's not hard to think that oh, so I think they really do have a timetable for running multiple apps side by side simultaneously. And that would be such an emphatic cool thing for a reason to say, you know what, not only do I want Want the 12 inch uh do i want a real big size ipad instead of an ipad mini i want this instead of the macbook air that i thought i was going to get because this is enough of a workspace that I can really lose myself in this window i will simply spend all of 80 dollars for a full-sized uh, bluetooth keyboard that frankly will even be better quality more comfortable to use than what's in the macbook pro right now it's it really could shift the the center of gravity over across the entire uh, the product line What's if you look at history, the RAM increases in iOS devices have almost always come with simultaneous improvements in what apps could do. Mm -hmm. Like when they started bumping from 512 to one to one gigabyte, we started getting not just multitasking, but background tasking and all these other things. And this this year, we've got a RAM increase. So what's Apple going to do with all this? They don't need extra RAM for, you know, there's no garbage collection. They get to write to their own metal so they don't have to have abstraction layers. There's no interpreter like Java running on top of it. That's a lot of extra room that they could theoretically do something super interesting with. What's the resolution on this? On the Pro? Yeah. They'll probably scale up. They've, they've gotten resolution independent now thanks to adaptive UI, so they can basically fill any screen bucket you So they don't them. care anymore. So the target also, is retina. Yeah, you don't have to double the, the iPhone 6 Plus or something yeah. like that. Also, if it's, if it's true that the, that the highlight of this is going to be multi uh, apps running side by side, <laughs> then we start to even not even worry about, well, this has to be a 2x scale because we have to fit into the right <laughs> box. But, well, because, well, because that now users, I would be very disappointed if their answer to running apps side by side on the iPad was you can have just the iPad view and then just the iPhone view of one other app next to it. It really would be slide this little separator wherever you want to go. Uh, and then Microsoft could say, yeah, we had a, we had a tile, the multi-app user interface with Windows 1.0. Thanks for catching up, Apple, finally. <laughs> Andy, don't look now, but there's an ad ad on your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming from the, oh, it's shooting at him. I hope those aren't Roman candles. <laughs> That's okay. I'll stay here until the last transport is away. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Scruffy looks. And it, when would they release it? Would they wait till the uh, fall as usual, or do you think we might see this one a little sooner? I, I, I think I, right now they go when they're ready. Uh, if it's ready in the spring, they'll go. They in don't. Spring. They don't if have not, any ca calendar anymore. 
No, I, I think, again, like we see so many products in the fall and we see products arrive so hot like the Retina iPad Mini because they're they're literally sprinting at the finish line as fast as right. they can go. They don't have anything sitting on the shelf burning a hole in their supply chain. Got it. I do think that they want to have a little bit of air around the Apple Watch announcement, but otherwise I agree with you. So, the okay, so let's get to the watch. Now rumors are March. Yes. Yep. I don't, I don't discount that. Early or late? I'm trying to, late. you know, time my savings account. <laughs> I, I, would, I would guess for the same reasons that the original iPad launched when it did, the original, the, the Apple Watch will launch in a similar time frame. I mean, there's just certain things that have to be in place for all that to happen. Yeah. Um, so again, we can't predict. We just have to, we have to wait. I don't want to my, wait. My, my, I'm trying to figure out if it'll go international right away because the iPad, uh -huh. neither the iPhone nor the iPad launched internationally at first. They both launched in the U.S. at first and then a couple months oh, later no. slowly moved out. So I might I might have to hitch on a plane back to your side of the country. Just to well, get one. But, but remember, remember that both of those had uh, had cellular radios uh, either as an uh, either built in or as an option. Because so, so FCC issues, so, you're saying. So, uh, and also striking deals with local carriers. So right. this, this could be a completely different situation. Well, I think I think, I think, I think at this too. I think at this point if they can't launch in USA and China simultaneously, I think that would not be a deal breaker, but that's something that Apple would say, "Oh boy, I really wish we could have at least done those two countries at the same time." Yeah. Canada I'm after about China. Canada. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't care about China. <laughs> what, 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 China? What about Montreal? Let's take a break. When we come back. Uh, new updates uh, across the board from uh, Apple. Um, we have more uh, analysts, including Horace Dediu, coming up with an interesting statistic. <clears throat> and uh, a Missouri State uh, representative who has a crazy idea. By the way, this just in. The gentleman who flew the DJI Phantom into the White House grounds at 3 a.m. had been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> don't drink and drone that's all i can say. no drinking and droning our show today brought to you by legal zoom you gotta love legal zoom these guys have been around for more than a decade making it easy to get things that you need to get done done easy and affordable and i think those go together a lot of times when you think oh i gotta make a will or i gotta do a trademark or patent or maybe i want to incorporate my business you do a living trust you think, oh, you know, it's going to cost money. Got to go to a lawyer's office. No, actually, no. LegalZoom is not a law firm. They give you the self-help services you need. So you direct it. You do it at a very affordable rate. But here's the thing. Stuff like this, it's paperwork. It isn't, you don't, you don't need a high-priced attorney to do this stuff. I did the LLC for Twit that we still run on 10 years ago at LegalZoom. Now, they've also added a legal plan, which is kind of neat. They have uh, contracted with attorneys in almost every state uh, who can give you legal advice at a low pre-negotiated fixed rate. You can get the uh, reviews, the, the profiles of the attorneys and unedited reviews from LegalZoom users on their website. That's nice. That gives you, you know, a little extra stuff if you've got a question. I had questions. I want to know, you know, why should I do it in Delaware versus California? LLC, Chapter S, Chapter C, what's the difference? Things like that. You can just ask them. You know, on the phone, you ask them. And it's very affordable. But let's see, where where should you begin to get your life in order? Maybe uh, protect your family. Do you have a will? How about a living trust? A, a medical power of attorney, things like that. LegalZoom can help. There's no easier way to make sure your family is legally taken care of. Uh, we did the we did the whole the whole, you know, power of attorney and all of that stuff. And it's really cool. You know, the medical directives. That's good to have. That makes you feel uh, makes you feel good. Uh, you don't have to worry. Take some worry off your shoulders. And also, you know, getting your business going can make a big difference. Not just LLCs, but Chapter S, Chapter C Corps, trademarks, patents. If you go to LegalZoom.com, you'll see the huge variety of, uh, of legal work they can do for you. And for more than 10 years, LegalZoom has helped millions of people get the personalized attention they need. And if you'd like more help, they will connect you with an independent attorney in more states. But they are not a law firm. They're legal Zoom. They're better. Don't let another year pass you by before getting your life organized for legal help you can count on for your family or for your business. Go to LegalZoom.com. Use the offer code MBW and you'll get $10 off at checkout. LegalZoom.com. I don't think we have a pet will for Ozzy. Do you see the pet protection? It's only $39. You take $10 off of that. Well, there you go. You should probably have a pet protection agreement. Jason, would you take Ozzy? You should have a you should have a dog for your actually girls. yes I would because yeah, our, our youngest would uh, go, go ape if she yeah. had a dog yeah. yeah 
See? All right. So there you go. I'll draw it up. All right. Cool. LegalZoom.com. Uh, and you can bet I'm going to use the offer code MBW to get 10 bucks off at checkout. We thank LegalZoom so much for their support of MacBreak Weekly and for, and for doing all that paperwork. Nice. Nice. Horace Didieu, we mentioned him uh, earlier. Dressed Right's the greatest blog. You could call him an amateur. I find him kind of more knowledgeable than almost anybody, a Simcoe. He came up with an interesting statistic. We had mentioned that Apple said uh, that in 2014 they'd paid $10 billion to developers. But just a great uh, a great stat. That's, that's uh, more than, um, what was it? Now I've, now I've lost it. Hollywood. Hollywood, right? Yeah. The iOS app developers earned more than Hollywood did from box office in 2014. That is a big economy you got here with the apps. That is amazing. Well, is, is Candy you know Crush the size of the Avengers? I mean, it's interesting. Like, <laughs> kind of numbers. It probably is, right? Yeah. And, well, you, and we, that, we I, talked about the numbers uh, from um, a Monument uh, Valley uh, the other yeah. day. And, uh, well, I mean, proportionately, they're not major motion picture numbers it cost them a little more than a million dollars to make it they they raked in five million but well still. and i think that i think one of the things that a lot of people say was whoa you know not all the developers make money well not all, everyone in hollywood makes money either there's a lot of people that are serving no. you know serving dinner <laughs> you know at different it's very, restaurants it's actually very similar break. where it's yeah. a, a hit driven economy right you investment know, banking oh uh, well yeah a lot yeah a lot of a lot of the apps don't make it but you know you know when you get when you get an iron man then you got a franchise. Right. $500 million spent on iOS apps in week one in January of 2015. Half a billion. Wait a minute. Let me say that again. Half a billion spent on iOS apps in the first week of this month. Yeah. And everyone gets their brand new devices on you know, yeah. Christmas and opens them up. Yeah. And it's got to be the biggest week, right? Or yeah. gift cards, too. One of two. And gift cards. That's right. Yeah. Michael yeah. got hundreds of dollars in gift cards. I that Yeah. Apple, by the way, kudos, because I've been entering gift cards from other people. You just show the gift card to the camera. Yes. And it goes, oh, yeah, I got it. That When you have 12 gift cards to enter, that is a boon. That is nice. And you can actually have Siri order ask, uh, send a gift card for you. Just tell Siri to send an iTunes gift card. No. Right there. Yeah. Siri, I love you, dude. A uh, lady. Whatever. Depends on the country. <laughs> <laughs> Cumulative developer revenues $25 billion, making 2014 revenues 40% of all app sales since the store opened in 2008. Billings for apps increased 50% in 2014. 627,000 jobs created in the U.S. We talked about that. That's kind of an interesting number. I don't know, but still. It's, it is kind of interesting. I, I've been spending a lot of time poking through Apple sites and also because of uh, Microsoft's keynote last week, uh, their sites, and then also looking through Google. And it's interesting how if you really just want to go through all the nooks and crannies, it's very, very easy to find on Apple where they're saying, here's how much we're helping the economy. Here's how, much, how, here's how many jobs we're creating. Here's the good that we're doing. It's also very, very easy uh, to find in Microsoft. Here is the actual real research that we're doing. Not, in addition to developing products, we're developing basic technologies and publishing supporting uh, research papers that are going to support all kinds of other work that's being done. Uh, Google maybe has a combination of both, but it's kind of interesting to see that dichotomy between, like, if we want to d devote some of our users' uh, attention towards things that are not directly involved with selling them a new phone or selling them a, a new piece of software, here's what we want, here's how we want to define ourselves to the public, and that's clearly what Apple wants people to know about. Here's a graph Alex Lindsay's not going to like too much. iTunes group gross revenues by product type, that, that little thin layer at the bottom, pro apps. <laughs> <laughs> then music, then video. Video is bigger than, is, music is bigger than video. The red one is apps. And that's, there, you see that's a big portion of revenue. That's gross revenues. So you take 30% of that goes to Apple, 70% to developers. Music is popular. If you look at Twitter, I think all the, the most followed people are music artists at this point. Not sports people, not Hollywood stars. Really? It's singers. Yeah, huh. I believe that's still the case. Huh. The popularity of music is amazing. 
Well, I think also uh, a lot of the pop stars and singers have, you know, that is a huge part of their business model. I mean, I think right, that a right. lot of them, the ones that are getting that kind of following uh, are are really doing some pretty interesting social Swift. outreach. Yeah. Oh, the, did you see the thing where she delivered stuff to yeah. to her best fans? Th those kind of things, you know, they're, you know, uh, and I have to admit that, uh, you know, Taylor Swift is, is a perfect example of, a, of someone who's kind of converting from the traditional, you know, music model to to something different. Now, even though she's staying with certain parts of it, obviously not putting it on Spotify, not doing a lot of other things, but her building up that that social brand, um, she's probably doing that better than almost anyone else, you know, in her industry at the moment. You know, she's just doing a lot of things that that make that make a lot of sense. So, but I think that whether it's her or Katy Perry or you know a variety of other artists, um, they, they there's nothing that's accidental about what they're doing there. And so, um, and I think that a lot of the sports guys aren't just not. They're not paying attention to that. <laughs> at I, know, I think there's too many. I think they're they're more faceless. I mean, look at uh, Taylor Swift's built such a community around her, um, and uh, so th this is the video that she made on YouTube of her um, <laughs> after something that became known as Taylorking, whereupon every detail of a fan's <laughs> likes, jobs, whereabouts was studied intently. A single Santa <laughs> emoji would appear on their socials from Taylor Swift. And then large, she would send them gifts, large FedEx boxes. She just picked people uh, kind of at random. I mean, obviously, she's not doing this. Her social team is. But these are people who got... That is a lot of the stuff I went shopping and got yesterday. She went shopping. Presents. And that's Meredith. For her fans. This awesome. kind of, this is just, I think... You can be cynical about this and say that, well, that's a great manipulation. But I, you know what? She's sitting there wrapping them. Now, is, is she also behind InfoSec Taylor Swift? Because that's <laughs> no. a huge service to the By the way, well. InfoSec Taylor Swift says, I think says she's given it up. She says, I'm, I'm tired of this. It's, joke's <laughs> over. <laughs> I still want to meet InfoSec Taylor Swift. It's a brilliant uh, Twitter feed. It enraged people. I remember the tweet that said uh, Android was the malware layer on top of Linux. And I think that almost broke Twitter for now. <laughs> I, I, you know, maybe your team put together the list or something, but... She's actually seems like she's seriously doing this. I mean, if, if this is fake, she put more effort into faking it than she would have actually doing it. She would also she would also uh, deserve credit if this was her idea for to simply not be the person who's executing someone else's plan, but someone who put a team together and said, "Here's what I want to do with our social right. media: come up with new ideas that come right. that more more powerful than simply tweeting out when we've got a new album out." Well, and I, I and feel I like she gets it more than many, almost anybody. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's her age too, right? I mean, it's not hostile to her fans. She's embracing it. Them. It really, it really is, it really is an instinct. I've, I've passed, I've spent the past six to seven months looking at people who produce content on YouTube, both as I'm just interested in this subject about how people use that to express themselves. And also because maybe I'd like to do uh, some, uh, some YouTube publishing. It really is interesting that people have that instinct for this kind of medium where they express themselves naturally in the form of a five minute video or as a way of connection uh, through social media, as opposed to I'm going to sit down and write something that takes 800 words, or I'm going to even write out a script that would take 15 minutes to play out on YouTube. It really, there, there are people who are just grown up with an instinctive understanding of how what this mechanism works. That's more than just simply write people write something and then people read it on their Twitter feeds. It really is. Here is a larger here's a larger machine that we're building. She's hand delivering. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine this fan. I mean, we've seen stuff like this before, and you know, as a publicity <laughs> stunt. I don't get the feeling this is a publicity stunt. I really. That, that, I mean, that obviously it is. Publicity stunt. She's she's delighted. It seems that's, like she's enjoying it. You couldn't fake that, and I think yeah, exactly. that's kind of critical to it. Is that she's actually she's digging this. She came up with this, and she likes it, and she's doing it because she likes it. I follow her on Instagram, and I'm you know the truth is I couldn't identify a Taylor Swift song to save my life, <laughs> uh, and I haven't bought any of her albums. Well, um, and one of the things but I, I admire also her just for this alone. And I also think that one of the things that's interesting that she's she's done as, as well as um, a variety of other artists is not trying to block every usage yeah. of their of their music on YouTube. And I think that's been extremely successful. If you look at how many lip dubs there have been to shake it off, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that 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 also helps build that community. It builds it builds this uh, kind of sense of of a singularity between lots and lots of different people that they've all used this as a as a context to express themselves. And I think that that is something that is, uh, 
um, that that some uh, the smartest artists, the Katy Perry's and the and the Miley Cyruses and the Taylor Swifts and a variety of other ones have have done very well. Have done have, have benefited very well from being a little bit more hands off than than some of the. Really, to be honest with you, has been 60s, 70s, 80s artists that, that don't want anyone to <laughs> Look use at their Prince. Music. Compare, contrast this to Prince, who just pisses on his fans, basically. Right. Uh, you know. Uh, Almost it, never during a performance, though, Leo. Not Let's during a performance. There are artists who have done that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but that's an, old school, that's an old school style. I'm the artiste above right. my audience. And, uh, and and you know what? That's probably, there's that's nothing wrong with that, and that's probably going to continue. There'll be people who do it. But I just admire somebody like Taylor Swift, who does seem, I mean, she's, what, 22 or 23? She grew up with the Internet. She grew up with all this. This is native to her. Um, and uh, she takes seems to take some delight in this. And uh, if if you can do that, what? It, but the interesting point to me is it's not, it, it's more than selling records. It's about building a community of fans. Yep. And right. that it's is a, incredibly powerful. Incredibly and it's powerful. Also, it's also about infrastructure that supports an artist. Uh, YouTube has been doing really well, but now they've started to make unusual new demands on musicians to basically say that right. you used, we used to give you the ability to say that if you want to let other people like you know put your music over other things, we will help you monetize it. We will help you make sure that you can take off things that are not good. But now it's like we will have to sign. We, you're going to have to give us such incredibly good terms to have that, that now they have to choose between either using YouTube or not using YouTube at all, as opposed to finding their own level of water. So we, this is no, talking about no Zoe, so Zoe Keating, obviously, exactly. and we talked yeah. about it on Twit. She's a cellist who has done quite She's well welcome. on YouTube and used Content ID on YouTube to identify because apparently uh, many of her songs, like thousands of her songs, have been used with her blessing uh, as background music and videos, including like the Game of Thrones uh, set special effects reel. And she's Content ID'd it because. If you do that, and you, you, you can choose to take it down, or you, but if it's not monetized, she can turn on monetization. Or, and more importantly, if it is monetized, she takes a portion of the monetization. It's a, it's a, a reasonable revenue strategy. YouTube has now come to her saying, you must agree to sign up uh, for our Music Key service to provide all your music, both free and paid on Music Key. And you can't do it exclusively anywhere else. Anything that you offer anywhere else, including SoundCloud, uh, or Bandcamp has to be offered on YouTube. I mean, it's pretty draconian. It's almost like the terms that got Apple in trouble with the DOJ. But it would be interesting to see if, for example, uh, I do podcasts that have video ads in it, or if PGP Grey or someone else who does, you know, some of the sponsored shows, uh, could YouTube come and say, well, if you do sponsorships on your shows, or if your shows are a certain length, you have to, you can't disable banner ads or, or right. overlay ads. I mean, well, it's, there's it's actually, a slippery there are, slope. There, there's actually a lot of rules uh, in, the, in the TOS with with uh, YouTube that, that do include that kind of stuff. Stuff. So they don't. I don't think that necessarily it's being enforced, you know, currently. But there's a definitely but it's a time um, one of the reasons. It's one of the reasons that a lot of a lot of folks, um, you know, choose to use, you know, YouTube's live streaming service, which we stream to a lot, uh, is um, is something that's very very powerful and very and amazing that it's free. Uh, but there are some restrictions on on how you use it, and and you know, part of that is is that there's a huge infrastructure that's supporting you being able to do this, you know, and I think that that's um, you know that that's the the other side of that. But it, it is one of those things that. I mean, everybody's going to have to, you know, eventually you're going to have to pay for what you're getting. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you, you know, you know, and that's the thing that you know, it, all these services, when we look at them, whether they're Google or, or, or many, many other services, Facebook, you know, eventually someone's going to have to make money on it. And so when they start to monetize it is when they, when they have a lot of, you know, in one way or another um, is when things get more complicated. I, I got to say that I think there's an argument to be made that they have already been paying for the service in the form of, uh, just, just like Apple doesn't make a whole lot of money off of hosting apps that don't do very well, they make a lot of money off of apps that do do very well. And so you have right. these people that can just do a whole bunch of cinnamon challenges and get audiences of <laughs> seriously tens of millions of people and then get to talk to the president of the United States of America. And this helps out Google in many ways monetarily and also by uh, increasing their advertising base. So I think that I, I, I've always said that I don't think that Google is a bad company. I don't think that they're turning customers into products. I do think that there's always that transaction that's being done saying, I will, you will give me free video hosting in exchange. Here's what I'm, I'm going to give you. And I feel as though that's a good deal. I think that there's so many because there's so many musicians who are feeling like this. You're not interfering with my ability to make a profit. You are interfering with my ability to 
practice my business, to express my art. If I can't post something very, very quick and simple on SoundCloud or Bandcamp, which is where a lot of my users, a lot of my fans uh, uh, go to look for me, you ruin my ability to make the music that I want to make. That's the danger that they want to uh, skid away from. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's one of those things that it, it, it's real. What the the biggest thing that's that's difficult in this in this whole process is when you start changing the rules. So when you, right, you know, you, exactly. the rules were one thing, and then you start renegotiating them. It, 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 and that's what every company has to do. They they're constantly moving these rules around. Um, but that is the the tricky part of of the entire process. You know, you you know the. Uh, um, you know, it's such an incredible, you know, they built it up by making it free and making it easy and doing all these other things as this incredible platform where half a billion people will watch a, a single Amazing. video, you know, and so, and it really is the, you know, radio, like when I want to listen to a song or someone talks about a song, half the time I just go to YouTube to see what it, you know, to, 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 <laughs> Me too. to hear the song, you know, and, and it's, and it really is truly playlists in some ways on YouTube have become a, have become a replacement for, um, you know, for radio, for some people, you know, for definitely a younger generation. And so, so I think it, they, they've definitely built that up. And then of course, when they, when they decide they're going to try to make money with it or try to fit it into a model that makes sense for them, it's difficult. And I, and you know, I'm the worst person. People change the rules on me and I'm, I throw all kinds of tantrums. So, <laughs> you know, so, so it's, uh, so I, I like I, him I when totally he's angry. Understand. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I have yeah. mixed feelings about it, uh, uh, too, because you do get a great freeze. We'll talk more about this, I'm sure, on This Week in Google, as we have on uh, Twit. Um, but you, I guess the point here is to contrast this to iTunes and uh, – but I, maybe not. I mean, she, by the way, Zoe Keating makes the bulk of her money by selling her music on iTunes. And right. iTunes doesn't let you sell directly. you still got to go through CD Baby. So it's not like YouTube. Right. You just upload a video. And iTunes isn't their own studio the way a lot right. of other companies is becoming. So it's it's interesting the battle they've chosen to fight. This just in, the drunk government employee who landed a drone uh, in the White House was an employee of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. The NGA huh. is the agency responsible for providing the government with timely, relevant, and accurate geospatial intelligence in support of national security. So really, it was a, it was a test. <laughs> it was all so research. He was off duty. He got drunk at a nearby apartment, heard about it the next day, turned himself in. It's like Are the Big Bang sure Theory when Wallow was perfect strangers. Yeah. I'm pretty sure this was an episode of Perfect Strangers where <laughs> Balky gets Balky. a toy helicopter and it lands in like the governor's mansion. Or, or during a... Well, you know, it's, 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 it's almost like, like the Big Bang Leo, Theory when I, I'm Wallow crashed the Martian rover. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm wondering whether it was more like exactly what you had described at your, at your house, where he just he and his friends were drinking. They're like, "Oh, let's go take let's this thing do out." The drone. And it just shot up into the sky, and yeah. then he just went. I'm sure okay, that's exactly well, what let's happened. Go back to drinking. I'm sure, that's you know, exactly you know, what happened. Uh, it's not, you know, he didn't. Fl I bet you anything, he didn't fly it toward the White House. It's really easy to lose control of these drones, as I know. Well, especially I'm doing. I'm doing. He's got a drone. <laughs> I, I feel that this is this this year is going to be like the year that drones both take off and cr and crash. Like there's some horrible well, drone stories. Are it's ahead a lot of, of us. stories. It's movies. It's, it's, yeah, it's it's movies like that that the Roman Candle movie that's going to have people yeah. at, at at the FAA going. Um, yeah, we're going to have to really do something about this right now. But what? You know? But what? I, I think, don't, I, think I, I don't want him to do it? anything. I'm, I'm quite happy. I live in you the country. You put Roman with the candles on your roof to shoot down the Roman candles on the drone, Leo. <laughs> I mean, if, if they get a I stick think, and a nail, you get a bigger stick and a nail. I, just want, I think that we need 3D printer templates for weaponry for our drones. That's all there is to it. <laughs> oh, it's Nets, it's very nets. simple. Start, starting with, with when the starting springtime, Secret Service agents will all be uh, equipped a radio, a gun, a taser, and a butterfly net on a really, really big long pole. <laughs> Protect America. According to Forbes, the world's most valuable brands. Uh, you know, I see these and I go, well, I don't know how how they do this. The top, I can't afford any of them. Yeah, well, that's true. Top 100 <laughs> most valuable brands span 15 countries and cross 20 industry categories. We started, they say, with a universe of more than 200 global brands. They had to have a presence in the U.S. They first determine earnings before interest and taxes. They average those over three years, subtract from earnings a charge of 8% of the brand's capital employed. Then they apply the maximum corporate tax rate in the parent's co parent company's home country to that net earnings figure. Then they allocate a percentage of those earnings to the brand based on the role brands play in each industry. To this net brand earnings number, we applied the average price to earnings multiple over the past three years. You know what? It was just a spreadsheet. That's all. They put it in a spreadsheet. And the, and the winner is Apple Computer, number one. What a surprise. Uh, brand value, $124.2 billion dollars. 
Well, that I think the crazy thing is, is, is that a 19% is that the, increase over last year. It's not just the 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 the, the ranking. It's the the difference between it, Apple and the and number two. I mean, it's almost it's twice. It's twice number two, which is Microsoft. Although I have to say, and I, I, event, this may be contra yeah, this may be controversial on an Apple podcast, but I'm very excited by what Microsoft announced uh, last week. Yeah, not too. just the a uh, Hololens, but I think Windows 10 in general. They seem to be uh, on track for a, a much improved strategy, which I is know, good. You need competition to keep everybody do. honest. Exactly. And this isn't this is again not to turn this we're not going to turn this into a Windows podcast, but one of the things that I thought was most interesting is I think that there are a lot of really interesting and really promising products in that keynote. I think the most interesting one of the most interesting though was the keynote itself, where it was really presented in the form of we not we can't just roll out a series of announcements. We have to shape a story and yeah. leave these journalists and the people watching the live stream stream away with a story of here's here's who we are as a company and here's what we are capable of doing so even if you see some bumpy spots over the next couple of years you will understand us by the trail of the dead that we follow i think it was fairly co fairly uh, compelling and it did follow the apple template starting off at the beginning with a uh, a uh, litany of how we're doing and 1.5 billion users and ending with satya nadella their new ceo in a mock turtleneck and black jeans <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing that all these years later, Apple still announces devices and Microsoft still announces platforms. Well, I think that's changing. I think the HoloLens is very interesting, and I wonder what Apple's response is going to be. But they didn't just announce the HoloLens. The HoloLens is an open development platform. Yeah. It's not like a closed thing. Okay, like, but like, that's, like Oculus. that's good, right? That's, that's, no, yeah, that's fantastic. That's what I love best yeah. about Microsoft. Right. I mean, that's, that's as I said on Twitter, we were talking, Renee and I were talking about this on Twitter like, during the day, and that it's like Apple is not capable of having success on the scale of a, of a Microsoft Office. Microsoft is not capable of having a success on the scale of the iPad. So that's, there's definitely pl playing to their strengths. Yep. I'm very well, excited. Interesting. And I wonder if the HoloLens will be, I feel it, it, we're looking at the future of a UI. Look, look at this, Leo. Uh, Facebook has uh, Oculus now, Google has Google Glass, and Microsoft has HoloLens. So they all all of them have a presence in VR or AR, however you want to term it. And Apple has nothing in that space yet. Apple but patent. Apple's also, a, yeah, Apple's got patents, but they're also, Apple's not a first mover in any of these categories. They're not first to phones, tablets, TV boxes, or watches. So if this is the next thing, at what point is that market mature enough for Apple to enter, and what way would they enter it? I think well, that's and it's also, Let's I think not forget App, that Microsoft Microsoft created the first mouse. It was Apple that popularized it. Right. Uh, I mean, I think that Apple's, your, I think sorry, much... the first mouse was created by Niklas Wirt at, at Logitech up to be, and actually even before that, Douglas Engelbart at Xerox Park. Yeah. But but the first commercial mouse was sold with Microsoft Office years before Apple came out with the Macintosh. Well, and I think that it's just a very, you know, Apple doesn't like to show their notes. <laughs> so so a lot of these other, uh, a lot of everyone else, and, and, I, and I don't really know, I mean, because I think Google Glass is a perfect example of the danger of showing your notes, so of throwing something out there, not not yeah. sure, and just see how people compelling. react to it, and yeah. then they react badly to it, and then and then it's really hard to kind of coil that back up again. There's a very big difference. Well, the Oculus Rift, you don't see what's out there. You're in a world of your very own, which I I tried find. it at CES again, like the latest version, and it is very disconcerting because you have it on, and it looks beautiful. Beautiful now and it's smooth and there's almost no compression and it's real time and you can move your head up and down you can jump up and down but you put your hands up and you can't see them and that is a very primal sort of okay. what's going on here feeling but two but two important things number one google is actually uh, uh, google glass is just one example of what they're uh, doing they're also a half a billion dollar investor in magic leap which is a very very similar very company similar doing, very similar right? exactly that has has made the most frustrating press releases known to mankind, which is, it's, it's almost like a scene from The Simpsons where they're going to tell you everything about how awesome this thing that they're building is, except for any details whatsoever, because they're, they, what they're doing is so top secret. So they're, they've are they got their hands in a lot of different ways of articulating that. But the thing is, I, I, uh, I don't want... Google and Microsoft and other companies to be dinged for, oh, look at them. They built, they they have this this Google Glass concept, and of course it failed after a year. Well, it didn't fail because they never actually did it as a product. They did, they I think they legitimately said that here are some ideas that we think might be important. We can't really figure out what how good these ideas are until we put these in the hands of real people and have them tell us well, how and, they're and, using this. And, so for for I, so Google Glass should definitely not be an embarrassment for them. If anything, the if there's a, there's a very short list of things I think that Apple is 
doesn't show as much confidence as other companies. That Apple is more than happy to make money off of something that they know there's a market for, and that they know that other people have been doing this. And they, there's no here's what here's a, here's a finished thing and a finished base of customers. Here's how we can do that better. They I can't think of more than maybe one instance in which they've done something where no here's a product that is so good that we are going to be pathfind pathfinders here. We're gonna be the innovators and the pioneers. We're not just gonna be the people who come in two or three years later after lots of hundreds and hundreds of explorers have died to find the route over the Rockies. Now that now that right. now we're gonna bring the the railroad in. Now that they've done that for us, so I wish that Apple could have a little bit. There there, there there would be an additional source of pride if they could point to things and say that there were there's no such thing as a smartphone and then we created the smartphone. There's no such thing as a tablet then we created the tablet. There's no such thing as a laptop then we created the laptop. Well, and, and I think that I think what's ironic about the whole thing is that, is that Apple is one of the biggest copy. You know, they have all these patents, but they're one yes. of the biggest copycats <laughs> where they look, they let everyone else, you know, be the front row. You know, because as I'm saying, I, there's something like as someone who has glass, um, and I think that there are things that glass does that nothing comes close to. You know, you want to do point of view training I videos agree. of how to do something. If you want to, oh um, no, 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 know, but I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, Hololens is gonna be better. Both both Oculus Rift and <laughs> Glass have a significant flaw. They're not augmented reality. They're not heads-up displays. Well, they demonstrated with HoloLens fixing a, a light switch, and you're looking at the actual light switch while somebody's on Skype talking you through it and drawing on your view of the light switch oh. to say, do this, do this. Much better than looking at a manual over your right eyebrow. It's a completely well, different but, experience. But, but we were doing, I mean, what we were doing with Glass was was two-way conversations where I'm, I see what you're seeing and you see what I'm seeing. Now, it didn't have the hologram where you're drawing on it, but I'm sitting there, what I, what I was doing was basically saying, okay, now grab onto this part of the camera and I can see, you're, we both have the same camera and you're either doing what I, what I, you know, I can see that. So it wasn't looking at a manual, it's actually talking to someone two-way. And that that was, you know, one of the things that was really good about glass and i think i i think that microsoft's product is going to be no, you know a skype oh, well, two-way like, two-way skype guy talking to you and furthermore yeah, right. drawing on right. the thing you're fixing and saying turn that right. this way now right right it's right. a it, it's, it's mind-boggling it's a much more ambitious thing, but remember that that was part of the thought process that Google put into uh, Glass to begin with. That you know how you know uh, Steve Jobs said, "Well, if you if you if you have a stylus on a touchscreen device, that means that that designer failed." Google's whole idea was, "Look, if this is putting something into your field of vision, then we failed the design." The whole point of their point of view for this was that here is a computer that it will not take up your, it will not obscure your vision, it will not obscure your hearing, it will not obscure your sense of touch. No phone can do that. No heads-up display can do that. No laptop can do that if this is just live your life do whatever you want to do except we will have this little piece of software that will put a little bit of a cue uh, uh, above your field of vision to help you not have to ever take out your phone ever again so it's 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 all it's about, a different it's, i understand it's a different it's, goal it's all, it's all about I, I love how like technology really is art and art comes from a point of view and a statement that someone wants to make and so there is a signature house style to the way that apple wants to design something there's a signature style to the way that google wants to design something and when you talk to the designers and you you've asked you why why is why isn't this like something that can actually put a put a, an arrow on this building to show me what uh, what what uh, what building i want to go to they will tell you that we don't want you to ever have something in front of your eye we want you to be able to see what you want to see, hear what you want to hear. Right. That's that, that's that's great design. No matter no matter how useful or not useful the result might be, I love hearing those stories from the designers of what their point of view actually was. I'm excited wanna... about the idea of augmented reality. I've thought from the day one, both Glass and All Oculus Rift awesome. missed the boat because AR is the future. And AR is not a new technology, by the way. I it's just want to know when years. the Amazon Cobra Commander style Fireface <laughs> is going to ship. Like, that's that's what I'm waiting for. The Fireface. <laughs> I, I <laughs> uh, you know everybody's now rushing if they haven't already already been doing it in secret labs somewhere uh, to create some AR solution. But I just I feel like this uh, Microsoft got it right now. There's a long history, uh, including the mouse, including the tablet of Microsoft being first to the table, but not being best. To the I don't table. want to be pessimistic, though, Leo. But the thing about this that I think intrigues them also, especially companies like Facebook, is on a phone, I can look at the Facebook app, press the home button. I can look at Facebook.com on the web, close the browser. And whether it's Microsoft or Facebook or Google, once it's on my face, they control my entire experience. Uh, and I can't just close that. I have to like, physically take it off. And once I've put it on, there's less impetus for me to take it off. So I think it also serves their purposes of getting much higher engagement and attention uh, in, in those can, kinds of interfaces. Not, or you cannot run that app. I think the, well, uh, as a matter of fact, I think HoloLens, you can just turn it off and then it's sunglasses. 
Giant, <laughs> giant sunglasses. Big sunglasses. <laughs> you know, I, interestingly, what if, what if they put, did not you, show what if the Hololens Beats logo on the sides of it. Then it would be absolutely palatable. They did not oh, anywhere in the, uh, in, the in the video show Hololens out of the house. It really is designed to be a, a adjunct to computing right. in the home, which is interesting. Um, I you look, I, it's I would guess you any absolutely that both Google and Apple will have something similar quickly. But um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if quickly I don't know for Apple. I don't think Apple, Apple would. I don't maybe see, not Apple, huh? I don't see Apple doing anything with in this space significantly this year. Yeah. You know, yeah, I think they've got I, plenty on their yeah. plate. They're going to be pushing through. You know, they've got other things doing. I, I'd be very surprised. They have a saying that they need a, they need a lot of people to try it and and create problems that they then think they can add value by solving. And there's not right. been enough trial and, and problems discovered for this yet. Yeah, that their whole their whole mo historically and their whole strength has always been here is a product that does not work well. We can make this product work incredibly well. Yeah, yeah. So you get, right. and that means you have to start off with a product that actually exists. Uh, anyway, times times are changing. Microsoft second, Google third, Coca Cola fourth. It's interesting. The three big tech companies are one, two, and three is the most valuable brands in the world. Then McDonald's, General Electric. Samsung's in there, number eight. Toyota. Louis Vuitton? <laughs> really? BMW. Oh, Luxury Cisco. Brand. I thought it said Crisco, and I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> no, Cisco. <laughs> Intel, Disney, Oracle, AT&T, Mercedes-Benz, Facebook, number 18. Walmart and Honda, the top 20. Oh, good for Larry Ellison. Yeah, yeah. The Oracle is Oracle, uh, yeah, 15, yeah. Right after Disney and before AT&T. They don't say most loved brands, notice. No. <laughs> <laughs> and every one of these guys is going to have a Super Bowl commercial. Rage of mouth marketing is impressive, Leo. <laughs> rage of mouth, I like it. <laughs> uh, speaking of rage, we're going to talk about uh, Missouri and Apple Pay in just a second. But first, audible.com. Love my audible. I was out uh, in the hot tub this morning listening to uh, my audible book. On my phone, Audible is a is a uh, is probably the only the greatest purveyor of audiobooks in the world. 150,000 titles, so many great books. I've been an Audible member since 2000, uh, which means I have a, I have I have something like 500 books in my library. That's one thing I like about Audible. Once a book is in your library, it's always there, and you could put the Audible uh, app on any device that you've got: Android, iOS, Windows Phone. Windows or Mac, and then and then listen, and I can go backwards and listen to all the great uh, stuff I've ever. It's a it's really like your bookshelf. I got the book you recommended, Andy, as you wish the uh, behind the scenes of the Princess Bride. I can't wait to listen to that. That's going to be fantastic. It's written by Wesley. <laughs> uh, if you go now, here's the deal. I'm going to get you. Weschler. I'm going to get you a free book. If you go to audible.com slash MacBreak, you can sign up for the gold plan. That's the book a month plan, but your first month is free. Your first book is free. And then you also get the Daily Digest of the New York Times of the Wall Street Journal, as, as you do with any subscription plan. Uh, you don't have to pay anything for the first 30 days. Cancel in that time, and you'll keep the book and have paid nothing. So it is a free book. But I think you might stick around. There are so many wonderful wonderful books on here what are you listening to these days uh the last audible book i finished just a few days ago was pat oswald's really good oh, memoir him. of his film addiction uh called silver screen fiend um you met one, one of my other favorite audible books was also a by comedian was steve martin he wrote a memoir that wasn't a more it was less of a memoir than a, bi a biography of a person that he used to be it was a biography of the stand-up act that he built uh, it, during the 70s and abandoned in the early 80s. This is similar to that. It documents a brief period in the late 90s, early 2000s, where he was just an absolute, he was always a film fan, but he became an absolute addict of cinema, spending every moment that he was not spending doing stand-up at the New Beverly Cinema, almost, uh, and watching movies and going back home and just opening up the psychotronic film guy or the guide or some other guide and checking off the movies that he'd seen and writing down the time and the date and the place where he actually saw it. And it's really an interesting story, a pretty breezy, about four hours long, I think. He, he reads it himself about he's developing his voice and his career as a comedian, as an actor, while having this addiction that is maybe about to, he, it was it was like uh, he was at a crossroads it seems in life where he can either commit himself from 
80% to his career to 100% to his career or be one of these people who just sees lots and lots of movies and talks about movies but never actually makes movies. And it's a really interesting story about how a person evolves at an interesting part of their life. And he's, it's I love these memoirs where it's the, the story is read by the person who wrote it and lived it. Uh, and he's just got a, gr a great voice you really kind of want to get into and listen to for four and a half hours. Yeah, you may not know uh, the name, but if you see a picture of Patton Oswalt, you'll immediately know. He's, a, he's, a, he's, he's one of my favorite, he's a, one of my favorite comedians him. and also one of my favorite character actors. He was on The King of Queens for like nine or ten seasons. Uh, he was uh, the voice of Remy the Rat in Ratatouille, but you really can't pigeonhole him with any one role that he actually did. He's got that funny uh, he, kind of squished up face. I guess he has a, well, he, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. right now. He also yeah, has a he, podcast, the Super Ego Podcast. I think he appears on it. I don't think that he's... Oh, he's a featured I he guest. I get it. You're yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Plays like oh, yeah, eight of themselves. Let me play a little... You'll recognize his voice probably. Let's listen to a little yeah, bit of... I just had to ask that question. Like I said, there were plenty of multiplexes in L.A. in which to see Con Air or Broken Arrow or Eddie Murphy's remake of The Nutty Professor. Nothing wrong with those movies. If people need bread and circuses, better it be bread from the best flour in spring water and circuses <laughs> under the cleanest canvas tents for the healthiest <laughs> animals. And it sounds like you. That's exactly the kind of thing you... <laughs> You would say, Andy. And by the way, happy birthday, Patton to Oswald. Patton Oswald, it's his birthday today, somebody's telling me. Yay. Yay. So that's it. This is good. You know what? What I did here, as you described that, I went to the book, Silver Screen Fiend, Learning About Life from an Addiction to Film, because I, too, love film, and I, I, I feel like that's been a huge part of my life. And then I added it to my wish list. So I keep a wish list of, and this is something everybody who's an Audible subscriber probably does, because you meet other Audible subscribers, and they go, oh, you got to listen to this or that. And so I actually have a fairly long wish list. <laughs> That's so that when I get credits, and I get credits every month because I have a subscription, I know, you know, oh yeah, I was going to listen to that. So I always add Andy's books. I highly recommend you do the same. Audible, but first you got to get an Audible subscription. So go to audible.com slash MacBreak. Sign up today. That gold plan is yours. That book, first book is free is yours. It's hard to choose, but browse around. You, I mean, there's so many great choices. Uh, I'm just a huge fan. Uh, it's pretty much all I ever do. And I listen, uh, you know, if you have the I, I, iOS or iPad app, um, you know, it makes it so easy for you to uh, listen wherever you are, in your car, at home, uh, on the uh, treadmill. I love it. Audible.com slash MacBreak. Please give it a try today. I think you'll love it too. I <laughs> see this Audible Snow Advisory. 100% chance of hearing a great book. Perfect. If you're stuck, <laughs> if you're stuck in the house because of the snow, <laughs> it's a, they say we got suggestions for every snow occasion. <laughs> Snowed in with your family, and that's another thing, by the way. You can all listen as a family. It's great to listen. We were listening to uh, the Lightning Thief uh, together, nice. and it's just such a great book, and uh, and uh, it's fun to listen as a family to a book to you know cuddle together by the fire. Highly recommend it. Audible. Don't listen to the porn clerk series uh, stories if you're uh, if you're listening with a family. Uh, Audible.com. <laughs> my, my, Although I'm tempted, I want to know what that is. Yeah, right. My dad was my dad was driving to North Carolina with my older kids, uh, but still at the time they were 15 and 17, and and uh, yeah, he was listening to the girl with the dragon tattoo. Oh, said he had to he had to yeah. stop. He had to stop. That wasn't going to work That's for the kind of a kinky, show. It started to build up. He was story. like, yeah, oh yeah. Here's, but, here's another tip. The, uh, the the version of Animal House that you see on cable all the time yeah. has been substantially edited from the <laughs> DVD you got from Redbox, so don't show that to your little kids. <laughs> <laughs> don't lick the minivan and other things I never thought I'd say to my kids. That's what you need to be listening to. <laughs> Audible.com slash MacBreak. Uh, you've all by now used Apple ID. You tap your iPhone uh, on the uh, register and boom, you walk out the door happy. Uh, with no more effort on your part. Well, apparently, one Missouri lawmaker says, no, 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 no. Too easy. Democratic Representative Joshua Peters from St. Louis, Louis says the bill he introduced Wednesday requires customers to show a state driver's license or other identification when they use a tap-to-pay app. Because that biometric witchcraft. Isn't <laughs> it's witchcraft. I don't know if I trust that touch ID. And also, clerks will be required to verify the identity and write down the ID number and keep it on record. Or the <laughs> and no dancing, no dancing no in my dancing. <laughs> Or the store could be held liable for fraudulent purchases. 
And of course, I'm you guys are just making fun of him. I'm thinking maybe Walmart got to him and said, "Hey, you know the problem with these uh, tap and pay is we don't know who these people are. They're not as secure as QR codes. Yeah, I mean, you really want to. Yeah, get a QR we would really like to keep track of these people. So could we're, you just we're going to execute down? this rampaging elephant is. using tap to pay to show you how dangerous it is. <laughs> To, to all of the constituents who are upset right now, you voted for him. Yeah. He mean, didn't you know, understand. You didn't. He says, uh, we want to make sure no fraudulent purchases are made using a stolen device. Apparently unclear on the idea of touch ID. <laughs> or the history of credit card fraud. Can, well, can and how much easier it is to make a fake driver's license than to fake a thumbprint. Or just you know, a social if, engineer with a stolen if card. If you validated this, of course, you, if, you, uh, if you validated that you can't prove that someone is who they are by their thumbprint, it would invalidate right. uh, an awful lot of criminal uh, That's a good prosecution. Point. That's all I'm Very saying. You know, you know, it's, it's, you know that, that is a pretty accurate way to do that, given that you are standing in front of them and you are holding it down. I don't know. It's, I mean, there's so many ways to... We send people out. I mean, I'm not going to get into it on my on air. But I mean, people use credit cards all the time that aren't... Yeah. That aren't theirs. <laughs> Apple uh, has some targets for battery life. And apparently, according to Mark Gurman and 9 to 5 Mac, once again, great scoop. The CPU inside the Apple Watch will be A5 level. A5. Current uh, iPad and iPhone use an A7? A8. A8. So A5 goes back to the 4S or the 5? 5, probably. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, A5 is what's in the current iPod Touch. It's the current Apple TV. Okay. It's plenty no, fast enough. Too. Yeah. For a watch. For a watch, yeah. Plenty fast enough. They want to hit 60 frames per second, Leo. It's almost like a, a religious thing for them. For the first time, people with knowledge of the Apple Watch's development have provided Mark Gurman with his specific performance targets Apple wants to achieve for the battery. Actual numbers may fall short of this. They have used a very powerful, relatively powerful processor for a watch. And a high-quality screen, both of which contribute to significant power drain. Running a stripped-down version of iOS codenamed Ski Hill, the Apple S1 chip inside the Apple Watch is surprisingly close in performance to the version of Apple's A5. Uh, while the Retina class color display is capable of uh, 60 frames per second, Apple initially, this is Mark Gurman again, I'm just reading him, Wanted Apple Watch to uh, provide roughly one full day of usage. That's kind of what Tim Cook implied. You'll charge it every night. Yeah. Uh, as of 2014, Apple wanted the watch to provide roughly two and a half to four hours of ap active application use, 19 hours of combined active passive use, three days of standby, or four days if in a sleep mode. However, sources say Apple will only achieve two to three days in standby or low power modes. That's certainly fine. Uh, I mean, you, you you might might have had the same experience I had with this Moto 360. That so long as I'm apps, I'm almost guaranteed to get through a full day with That's this all I thing. care about. Yeah. Even even and we can even if we define a full day is I have to get up, check out at my hotel at 4 a.m., do all kinds of meetings, then go out to dinner with friends, and then catch the red eye home. And we're we're sort of defining full day as like 22 hours. I'm fine. Anything above that, because again, I've got to, at the end of the day, I'm going to take off this watch and put it on the nightstand. I'm not averse to putting it on right. top of a charging pad no. when I do that. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because the Moto 360 shipped with fairly poor battery life, but with several firmware updates, it's actually pretty darn good at this point. Yeah, I mean, they had to, it was a, it was actually a failure, it looks like, with uh, the software where if it couldn't, if it lost contact with the phone, it would just, just scream for help, <laughs> bloody murder over right. and over again until right. it killed the battery. Right. Uh, but they did some more tweaks too. But again, now that it, it, I, if they gave me an extra couple of days of battery life, I would certainly take it. But it's just a, there's a point at which it's like, okay, this is good enough. Apple's still looking to get two and a half hours of heavy application use, such as gameplay, processor-intensive gameplay. Oh. So if you're playing Snake on your watch, it should go for two and a half hours. Anybody so, plays yeah. Snake for two and a half hours, yeah. you know. That's, there's no native that's, apps until next year, until later this so year. That's so that's not, not even an issue, yeah. right? Three and a half that's, hours of standard app use. So, and that means with the screen on. That means use with the screen on, the screen that, updating, you staring at it. Yeah, I and mean, that's actually pretty good, uh, given my experience both with phones and watches. Three and a half hours of screen time is a lot for a day. Most people, I, think is, I, think you, I, th I think I'd even say that's too much for a watch. If you're saying that you expect anybody to spend three hours looking at this, right. you're probably not clear well, not on what solid. this watch is for. I actually think, think, think that if, if you did more, do that, just, you, the more, you, you need to have a... The, go ahead. The, I'm sorry, just to, I'm sorry. Just, this is one last thing I want to say was that the more important thing is how long can you exercise with this and still have the battery? Can you actually run a, a full marathon? four hours of straight exercise tracking. Yeah. So, so you that's can run gonna, a marathon if you're fast. 
if you're if you're a a a because because really good marathoners so, so are my, down to so three my, hours, my, my right? New, my new training goal is to actually make it to the end of this Four run hours. before the the watch so, like stops collecting data. <laughs> the, the, whether it's a phone or it's a watch, the thing is that battery life is a currency, and you spend it. And if you add a radio, that spends more battery right. life. If you add a screen, if you add color, if you add density, all of those things are battery life that you're expending. A Pebble is an e-ink display that gets lots of battery life, but some people want a color display and some people want other features. So you always have to get this trade-off of how much stuff it does versus how long it does it for. And One of the big like, issues, again, then, and we've noted this with uh, Android Wear watches, mm -hmm. is the display of time. And Android Wear watches, in fact, all those smart watches I've ever used, when, you're, when your hand is down, your wrist is down, they go dark or they yep. go to a very low power display. Apple uh, has conducted numerous tests to determine how long it can run in purely timekeeping modes. German says, we're told the watch should be able to display its clock face for three hours, including watch ticking animations. Moving, move, Any moving parts use more juice, as you yeah. said. And again, that's if you're staring at it. Like uh, John Gruber mentioned this on the talk show last week, and I've heard similar, but they've spent an inordinate amount of time testing the, the gesture for looking at the watch, turning right. it on, putting it away, turning it off. And that's the kind of thing that helps them get battery efficiency. That's one thing that's weak on the Moto 360 in my experience. I don't know what your experience has been, Andy, but but sometimes when you flip your wrist up to look at it, it doesn't wake up. And you kind of have to shake your wrist a little bit to see what time I, it is. You know, I had I had that exact same problem the first day, but that's because I think uh, it was residual effects of wearing the pebble for a month and a half, where I feel as though they're looking for the accelerometer thing, whereas this is just simply, it's, it's, I, so you it's, should, not, asking, it's you, not asking for a snap, it's just asking for... Uh, just asking for a, a simple turn. As soon as I retrained my wrist to not expect it to be a pebble, I stopped bothering. But yeah, oh, you're so right. which it's should I do? So should I go like this, just, or should <laughs> I just go like that? Nope. Don't 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 snap. Just go like that, just and it will like light that up. Is all it needs. Okay. So I need to be trained on how to look at my watch. Apparently, <laughs> you're, tur you're turning it wrong, Leo. I'm turning you're back, it you're, wrong. You're back, well, you know, you're that, back that, that's that's the whole like the singularity is the convergence of us of the the machines getting trained up for to us and us being trained yeah. to the machine. Yeah, some of that has to happen. It's so well, when you talk to Siri, you know, it's like Siri, I, you know, call Frisch home. That's an actually, that's a great point. Cause that was the same thing. Like, the first two days with this watch were incredibly frustrating because of how poorly other devices work. Because I was talking to, uh, I was, it does voice commands. And I was talking to it like Siri and was getting it right. Maybe half to three quarters of the time. But as soon as I said, <laughs> take a note. Remember that uh, tomorrow there's going to be 400 people coming and they're going to be arriving at 2 p.m. If I just speak normally, 100% right. almost every single time I say, remember that right. tomorrow 400 people <laughs> are coming. Right. It's true. You don't, have, it? you, don't, you don't have to talk to it as though you're angry with it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is what you have to do with Siri. German says nearly Siri, in order remember tomorrow to pick up eggs. Excellent enunciation. It's training a whole new generation of enunciators. <laughs> I'm a trained professional trained announcer, and I have difficulty. <laughs> I'm You're trained, a trained, trained announcer. I'm You're a, a trained, trained announcer, announcer professionally. <laughs> I, the I'm waiting for some Cucamonga Express, ready to leave yeah. from track nine. <laughs> track stops. nine. Where do you go to school for that? Back Bay, <laughs> Ruggles, Hyde Park, Route 128. I would like to do that actually. I want to do it in France. The uh, I love the French. <gasps> da 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 da. Elvia. <laughs> uh, apparently, Apple has circulated 3,000 test units uh, already. So you might, if you go to the uh, campus, see a few people wearing these watches, mostly the stainless steel variant. They've also it's probably, it, it probably you have to probably come in and have them unlock it off your wrist. You know, it's you oh yeah. Though, uh, or they put it around your ankle the, like a uh, home arrest device. Yeah, exactly. You can tell by the Milanese of their bands, Leo. You can tell them by the Milanese of their I bands. I want that Milanese band. I don't even care about the watch. I just want the band. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, no, that, you know, I was, I've been really thinking about the bands. I This is going to be a crazy huge industry is the bands. Oh, yeah. Because I, I you know, I, now now that you the watch is coming, I saw this. I don't know if you've seen this thing that Leatherman has yes. now has a band with screwdrivers. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they have like a little watch, and, I, and I, all I can oh, think of, look at you it. know, they have a watch edition that they're offering, and all I can think of is, oh, that would be a great band for they're, my. They're for getting my a Apple lot of watch. calls, Alex. Yeah, <laughs> I do I, know they're getting a lot of calls. Will like, it's I, called the my, Leatherman. My second thought was that if if your tread. problem is like with bands like that, it's like hairy wrist. Don't worry, after two days of wearing that watch, <laughs> hairy wrist will no longer be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> this is the Finally. band, by the way, one hundred fifty to two hundred dollars. The Leatherman tread. It's definitely kinky. Mm -hmm. And it turns uh, into a knife? What? No, no, no. Oh, it does like not every, turn into a knife. Every one of those links. All those things are little screwdrivers. They're little tools? 
Yeah, yeah. you just you just take it off and you and you like fold it to what, what screwdriver you want. And then you and wow. I gotta tell you, I use a, I use little screwdrivers a lot, and I I need one. This That's is the lumberjacking of America. Yeah. No, no, the, there's, a great, there's a great story behind it. Like the, the guy who designed it works for a leather man and was frustrated because at some sort of security checkpoint, he had to hand right. over his multi-tool even Every though he didn't time. have a blade on it. Yep. And it's like, if I, if I hide things on a bracelet, they're not going to challenge me, are they? Is that true? You can go through uh, customs or whatever? Well, uh, well they, they shouldn't because it's not a, it's not a blade. So there's what no kind blade of problem are they going to have with it? I'm and sorry, and sir. I'm sure your watch band is a set of screwdrivers. Wow. And my tie is your detonator. What? What's your issue? Awesome. Wow. It's, isn't that thing awesome? What the hell? I'm sorry. <laughs> exactly. But... You want this now. <laughs> what the this hell? Is the magic Look at that. See, you just fold it, and there you go. Oh. Pop your tri tri oh. tripod down off. Oh, I want this. <laughs> I know. Now, See? do we know if Apple's going to make the uh, attachment to the uh, watch proprietary, like the MagSafe adapter? Yeah. So there's there's, there's no, there's no chip too. in it. There's no, no but you have to so. light. Oh, I guess you could duplicate it, huh? There's probably a lot of factories in China. Reverse right engineer it. Week. But I, I bet, I bet there's going to be some sort of like MFI program that says, well, you know, of course you could buy cheap knockoffs, but if you have this logo on it yeah. and pay an extra eighteen dollars, you know that this has been right. made to the exceeding tolerances oh. of the Apple. Well, it'll just keep on releasing on, on its own. Otherwise, you know, it just just it just keeps popping off. But or, that or that something. MFI program is not a joke. I mean, they test they test that stuff inordinately. But yeah. I mean, really, test a watch band? Really? I mean, do we need to? Well, I don't know. Well, All I can I, say I is I think the there's going to be an MFI. I think, I, I I think they, they want. I think they want to protect the value of the MFI brand. Yeah. And so I don't. I don't think they'd miss the trick to say, "Look, we have MFI certified bands that here's 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 rubber bands that have been like torn apart. Here's right. a watch that fell apart and fell into a toilet. But hey, if you have an MFI band, you will never toilet Exodus you, your five thousand. If you go to the uh, MFI page edition. now, it'll say what kind of accessory do you want to make. If it has things that need like the accessory protocol or the home kit protocol, you need MFI. If you're making a case, just go download our schematics right now and bless you, sir. There, so yeah. It depends which way they go. So there will be a MagSafe uh, inductance charging mechanism for the watch. That will I presume be proprietary and probably expensive. Um sources according to Mark Gurman indicate that was responsible for slower than expected recharging times. Something they're obviously going to want to work on. Uh, there are plastic and stainless steel versions of the charger, depending on which watch you get. Um, end of March. Start saving now. I want one. I'm I, gonna really, I really want to see the over-under on what the addition is going to cost. That's <laughs> going to be the fun number. That's the expensive yeah. one, right? The addition. You start, you start off with more than five grand or less than five grand, yeah. and then you start to say six grand. Yeah. Well, it's fun because you can charge anything. I mean, if, if they go by traditional watch companies, you can charge anything you want because you're not paying for materials beyond a certain point. You're right. paying for a fancy watch. And that's you know almost limitless in price. Yeah. But that's uh, how, how well can they sell the point that can they make the case that, no, no, we didn't just take the molds for the cheap one and put a more expensive <laughs> metal in it and change the markup to 8,000% instead of 40%. At least, at least you know, the, the, it's a, a great form of entertainment is watching these, like the, these companies that really, really need to sell you on the craftsmanship. Here's eight, an 83-minute unedited video, video of a watch engineer hand-shaping just one time <laughs> on one gear in this watch. And there are 400 gears just like it. <laughs> The That's interesting thing is like there's $900,000 marketing is all social engineering. There's always a low tier, a mid tier and a high tier. And you have to pick what's palatable to people. So Apple traditionally has said people will pay for a bigger screen or they'll pay for more RAM, regardless of what the screen or RAM actually costs them. Those are what we'll accept to pay higher tier prices for. And this time they're trying it. Well, there are two different sizes, but they're trying it mostly with materials. Will they pay more for aluminum? Will they pay more for gold? And yes, there's a cost to the extra components, but it's just how much the market will bear uh, those price steps. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's like a subset of people who want to be able to say that they have the expensive watch because they can afford it. I mean, I think that that's the bottom line. I mean, they're gonna uh, they're gonna put enough into it. I don't know if it's gonna be a real value. It's not something I would get, but it's yeah. but I think that uh, I think that there's definitely a subset of people that buy iPhones that put the gold plating on them and you know all the bling that they add to them. So I think yeah, that that's gonna be that's Kim the target Kardashian. audience. Do you, yes. Exactly. Do, do you want? Do you want to like the lifestyles of the rich or famous tour of any Trump, any any apartment that Trump, that Donald Trump lives in, where it's like, you see this toilet seat? It's made <laughs> out of twenty four karat gold. It's incredibly luxurious. And everybody else is saying, yeah, you're a damn idiot because you just took something common that works the way you and you just made found a way to spend one point eight million dollars for it. You're dumb. Heavy metal poisoned your butt, Donald. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's a huge butt. <laughs> <laughs> updates are out. Updates are out all over the place. 10.10.2 uh, for OS 10, which also includes a remote desktop client update. Uh, yeah, 10. Ten point ten fixes. Say again, and some really good security fixes. Yes. It fixes the Thunderstrike bug. It fixes the, uh, the the Google Zero days. It fixes the kernel exploit. A lot of good stuff in there. Resolves an issue that may cause Wi-Fi to disconnect. Seems like that you should just that's boilerplate. Every every update should every do that, release. and it'll Res break it for a percentage yeah. of people too. Resolves an issue that may cause web pages to load slowly. Fixes an issue that caused Spotlight to load remote email content when the preference was disabled. Moo. That could be embarrassing. Improves audio and video sync when using Bluetooth headphones. Adds the ability to browse iCloud Drive and Time Machine. Improves voice over speech performance. The Spotlight thing was a privacy thing because you could disable uh, automatically right. loading images, which was tracking pixels in the mail, but Spotlight would still show them. So now Spotlight respects the preference that you Man. set in Oh, mail. that's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, addresses an issue may cause the input me method to switch languages unexpectedly. Improves stability and security in Safari. And yeah, most importantly, uh, fixes a, a number of security issues, including Thunderstrike and those, as you mentioned, it's Google Zero Days. So you, you, you must download that and install that as quickly as you can, if you're using, obviously, if you're using Yosemite. Uh, there's also updates for uh, iOS, right? Yeah. Uh, also, uh, just as an aside, uh, Mavericks and Mountain Lion also got Safari and security updates ah, as well. Right, so. because some of those Everyone issues, yeah. who who was yelling last week that Apple had abandoned, you know, older versions, no. not once again, not true. 8.1.3, <laughs> bug fixes, stability, and big deal, re reduces the amount of storage required to perform a software update. That's really important. Maybe even a response, kind of backhanded response to that class action lawsuit over uh, storage. But people with 8 gig or 16 gig iPhones will be happy to know. With Apple, like the, the usual response is a very human one. When people had trouble downloading the update for iOS 8, there's a bunch of people at Apple who have a bunch of relatives who have those phones yes. and have those same problems, and they're, they want to fix it. They actually, you know, it, it, not everyone has the latest phone. You, you have people working on the iPhone whose relatives have iPhone 4S, and they want to make sure there's yeah. really good performance for that. Yeah. And so they, they were determined to fix this, and I installed it on a couple of devices, and it was lightning quick. I didn't have to re-log in. I didn't have to reboard. I just downloaded it. It was ready to go. Safari was faster. The phone was faster. Uh, it, it was a really good update. Good. So 10.9, 10 10.8, 10.9, 10.10 10 updated. iOS 8.1.3 out. Apple TV pushed an update this week, too. Uh, 120 sports have been added when no no a channel called 120 sports has yeah. been added <laughs> what is that they can the thing with apple tv is there's two separate tracks for that so you have the software update they'll get new versions of ios apple tv runs ios but apple insists on labeling it with a different version number it makes right. it a little bit confusing but they can actually the way that the springboard works on apple tv is they can those are essentially almost like web apps they can push an icon oh, that goes okay. somewhere so this isn't really an like, update then it's just a new it's a new channel. It's the same way the Apple events channel shows up before every event. The iTunes right. festival icon shows up and then goes away. It just okay. they can add things to that grid whenever they want to. Okay. Any any problem reported with the iOS or OS 10 updates? Everything's going okay, everybody. Somebody's yeah, saying uh, the iOS update bricked my iPhone 6. Code Wrangler says. There will always be a percentage of people for whom the update has an ill effect. And yes. that's just because of the complexity of the code base at this point and how many differences yes. there are in everybody's phones. But usually you can restore it or do something that'll get you back on track. 120 Sports apparently is on-demand uh, video from the NBA, the MLB, and the NFL um, and has sports news and highlights of recent games. So, And I think this is going to be a really interesting market to, to watch as, as these uh, all of these sports networks are all kind of – or they're becoming their own network. They're kind of slowly – you know, they're still taking yeah. the money from the broadcasters, but yeah. – they got their own, they own the content. They're they're doing you know video on demand right now. But it is a frightening thing for a lot of these broadcasters to think about what it looks like if the NFL just decided to start distributing all of the, you know, everything live. You know, at some point, which is probably twenty years away. But it's it is something that is they're all kind of moving towards is taking more and more control over that content, like HBO, right? Like HBO, like CBS, like uh, you know, a lot ESPN of ESPN with the uh, Dish. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, eventually yeah. all of the everyone's going to have. I mean, all of the networks themselves are going to have their own play. You know, I think that's that's also kind of coming down the path is that everyone is looking for how is their app going to work on the phone. It's you know, and the, and the real loser is not so much the networks as much as the cable operators <laughs> as as this become as cable operation where it really is cutting the cord. But in a the cable operators are going to have to be happy with serving up uh, you know bandwidth because everyone's going to be getting it in a whole bunch of different ways. And I think that part of the problem is is that cable can can't move as fast as as HBO, you know, wants to uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think that we're, you know, it'll be interesting to see in April whether we see start seeing some, you know, 4K you know, Game of Thrones or in March. You know, it's that's amazing. The, it's amazing right? how the intermediation has moved from the transport to the display. You always have a middleman, but now it's no longer the guy in the truck. It's the guy who makes the screen that you look at. Right. Well, and, and I think that it's, but I think that there's there, there's a real opportunity here where we're getting to a point where the content creators are, are getting closer and closer to the consumers, you know, where the people who are writing it and doing it are getting much closer and there is, there's less and less, you know, proxies in between, which is, I, I think, pretty, uh, it's pretty exciting for content creators where it's, you know, it's not the movie industry or the cable networks or the, the cable companies, you know, all of that stuff is kind of going away and being distributed. Now there's still YouTube or iTunes or all these other things. So there's always going to be somebody managing that distribution. But but I think that the, con the creator has more control over this than they, than, they, than they ever have. Well, of course, Sunday is the Super Bowl, probably the most valuable television program of the year. And NBC says, if you have an iPad or a Mac, you can watch it for free. They're debuting a new SuperStream Sunday promotion, which allows U.S.-based users to watch 11 continuous hours of content. <laughs> through the NBCSports.com website or the NBC Sports Live Extra app on your iPad or iPod Touch. I just want the American commercials. That's all I want. Just I don't think, the, I right. wonder if they put the commercials on or not. You know, every time they've streamed, I've seen streams in the past, they didn't have the commercials, which really makes it you, much less interesting. Oh, you can always, oh, who cares? You can, always, you can already see the commercials like three days beforehand. This I is, know. This is, this is starting to become like CES where everyone wants to announce something before right. everybody's announcing everything. I want to so watch it like, in C2. I like to see it in the exactly milieu. You, you, you need to it's just like seeing public art in a museum as opposed to <laughs> the right. parkland which it was intended that's right super Otherwise, stream sunday really starts february 1 at noon eastern time that will not only will you get super bowl 49 you'll get the halftime show with katy perry and the pre and post game shows and an episode of the blacklist and you don't even have to have a cable subscription nice and there's also a special there's a special setting so that it'll make the game last even longer. <laughs> Every time I they want stop the, the cut clock, down. add another thirty seconds to the clock. The cut we when can, they cut out all the commercials, all the all the jabbering, yep. all the timeouts. It's a, a an NFL game is about eleven minutes long. I'm kid, I kid you not. <laughs> when, when you add Marco Armand's smart speed, is about twelve minutes. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but it's it's getting it's getting more watchable. Be believe it or not, I had a, I had a brush with great technology at it went, i went, went out to breakfast last week and i was told by the person that was had been sitting there for about 45 minutes that he'd had a conversation with two people who were responsible for miking up uh players uh for the for the new england patriots and they had a long this he's, he's a mac developer too and so they had a long conversation about all the telemetry that's wired into these uniforms just to make this make football more watchable for people who are not just insanely involved in football and the under and the 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 underwriting theme is that the whole goal is for the NFL to make these games look just like John Madden NFL games you know because people are now expecting to see uh, right. electronic illustrations they're expecting to see like these camera shots that would have been impossible they're expecting to see players highlighted as they're moving and they're trying to do that sort of stuff so I, I kind of like now think that I want to like start watching football because it's always been so boring to me because again four hours it's supposed to be as the, the 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 math nerd says four quarters of 50 minutes each four times 15 is 60 minutes why is this taking four and a half hours even minus well, the 45 I, minutes music musical dance number well and the and, cool the cool thing about football in, in general when it comes to media production is is that you have an, a a a, a, a um, piece of content that is making a lot of money. I mean, it is yeah. just <laughs> printing money. And and all they want to do is, okay, between last year and next year, how are we going to make this even cooler? You know, you know, like, like and, and they're, they're not, it's really not a budget item as much as it is, <laughs> as it is like, you know, how do we make it work? I love you the know? NFL and I love, they have a, a thing on the NFL network of the, all the sound from the games that, because they mic up all the players <laughs> Here's, I'll play a little bit of it for you. It's amazing what the players actually are saying. You see them <laughs> from a distance, but here's what they're actually saying. It's kind of, it's kind of amazing. Oh. <laughs> you give me a complex, man. 
You gotta eat the breakfast. We we'll eat breakfast, then lunch. I have <laughs> flaps. <laughs> I just forgot to breathe. Holla, we gon' bow. Why are you, you know, always angry? Once there was this prince, he came from, like, Syria, okay? And he lived with some peaceful monkeys outside his aunt's boyfriend's cabin and had an old sheepdog named Paco Sinbad. I can just <laughs> okay, I just want to tell you, it's not Go what on. you thought. When you Go ahead, you, you two smart master. Make fun of people who, who hurt people for a living. That'll work out great. Actually, it's a that's, of course, bad lip reading. They do it every year. Uh, this is the new one, NFL 2015, a bad lip reading. I, they're so good at it. I don't know how they that's do it. Hell. They are so funny. Uh, all right, let's take a break. When we come back, your picks of the week. Gentlemen, line them up, and we'll knock them down. Uh, but first, a word about my mattress. And that is not a bad lip reading. I actually want to talk to you about my Casper mattress. Uh, Casper is an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost. They are changing the mattress industry. Now, you might say, well, I'm not going to buy a mattress online. What if I don't like it? Don't worry. In fact, I would submit the idea of going to the mattress showroom and lying on it for five minutes under bright lights while some salesperson stares at you is not the best way to see if that mattress is right for you. You have to take off your clothes. You have, to, you have to really interact with that mattress. And Casper lets you do it for 100 days. They offer free delivery and painless returns within a 100-day period. So you don't have to lie down in the showroom. And you can really know if this is the right one for you. Here's my queen-size Casper. comes in a very small box. This is really convenient. I got an email from somebody who said, you know, I, I tried to get my king-size mattress in our apartment. They couldn't fit it. So we had two twins. But see, Casper, you could fit any size mattress through any size door, you just open it up. The mattress uh, <laughs> made of latex and memory foam. So you get kind of the, just the right sink, just the right bounce. It's firm but comfortable. Uh, I, it's my favorite mattress of all time. I love my Casper mattress. And you know what's great? Well, doesn't that look comfy? You know what's great? <laughs> it's not expensive. $500 for a twin, $950 for the, the biggest they make, the king size. That is a great price compared to that showroom price. And as a listener to Mac Break Weekly, you're going to save an additional $50 off by going to Casper, C-A-S-P-E-R dot com slash Mac Break and use the promo code Mac Break. That's Casper, C-A-S-P-E-R dot com, promo code Mac Break. Even Ozzy loves our Casper mattress. You're going to love it too. Casper dot com slash Mac Break. Save $50 off a beautiful, beautiful mattress. We love but those Caspers. They were at CES. They let us jump on the bed. They were amazing. That's right. They had them at CES, didn't they? Yep. George and Svenerty and I just jumped on the bed, and they were just so happy that you Isn't know, that nice? It. Yep. You know, that looks like, I, I just look at it as like, I bet you that's checkable. The twin one is probably checkable. <laughs> you can like probably that. check it. <laughs> you have like a little, you, know, you can bring it with you. Carry your bed with you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And then I, 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 I have an email that says that my Casper mattress is on a truck on Monday, uh, yesterday. Oh, you got one. Good for you. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so, 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 I, so I hope that, like, if the driver, like, got stuck on I-95, I hope yeah. that he unpacked Sleeping. it, laid it out, <laughs> and had a good night's sleep on I-95. You, I want to hear next week or whenever uh, how much you like it or not. I've got one. It's, it's fantastic. I love them. Yeah, they're great. I love them. Uh, pick of the week. Let's start with Renee Ritchie. So I, I have to confess, I haven't had time to try this yet because I was busy doing all the coverage today, but Alfred Remote has come out for iOS. If you're a fan of Alfred I on love the Alfred. desktop, yeah. it's terrific. It's like, you know, the modern version of Quicksilver. It makes, it's like Spotlight on Hulk Serum. It lets you do a sor all sorts of keyboard wizardry with your Mac. And now you can do that same stuff. And there's a, they have a video up that shows you, you know, some of the awesome things that you can do. But it's it's just super impressive. You take your iOS device, you control Alfred on your Mac, and it makes, if you are, I have to say, like, this is this is nerdery of the first degree. You're going to want to, you're the kind of person who would run Alfred on your desktop to begin with before you'd have any interest in the iOS app. But if you are the kind of person who would do that, uh, you will find this to be just, you know, completely up your alley. I'm a big uh, fan. Had I, really love, I really love Alfred. So you need Alfred on the Mac to make this work. Yes. Uh, and you control it with your iPad. Yeah. And what, give like me an example. Projection. One thing you could do with this. There, they'll show you right there on the video. It basically just shows you all your Alfred, um, uh, what's the right word, all your Alfred activities. And again, I haven't had a chance to use it yet. Right. I, I have downloaded it, but I'm looking forward I to it. I use Alfred on the Mac. Love it. It's a great, it was, a, it was the replacement for Quicksilver. Yes. And uh, I love the guys, too. They're really, uh, they're really nice. Do you need the There's power some, pack to use Alfred Remote? or? I don't know. I bet I'm not. not. Although if you had the power pack, you could do even more. That's yeah. the... 
and get it any. I mean, get it anyway. Great. Support them. Why not? Yeah. All right, Alfred Remote for iOS. You need it on your desktop as well, but it's uh, uh, highly recommend it. Alex Lindsay, your pick of the week. So um, I I do a lot of events, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> oftentimes. Uh, oftentimes, you know, you're, you're recording those events and, and you're, it's kind of an imperfect situation and you get some echo from a big room or you get a little bit of hiss because you turned up the mics because that's what you had to do to pull everybody in and, and you have to go back and fix it. And there's a lot of great tools that are built into many of these applications, whether it's uh, your sound editing, op, you know, applications or Final Cut 10 or whatever else you're using. And almost all of these, you know, allow you to use plugins. And, and one of the plugins that I've started to use for a lot of this to kind of clean things up is um, is from Isotrope, and this is called RX4, and uh, and I've gotten it for I got, I got it for a couple jobs, and now it's something that I, I find myself really digging into. So these are this is a really you know it's not the cheapest solution. I have the advanced one, which is I think about a thousand dollars. Is it a plugin? It's a it's a plugin and a standalone. So it'll open up as a standalone, but it'll also open up. You can it'll also you'll see all the plugins in Final Cut 10. Um, I, that's what I'm using. I'm most, mostly using it in Final Cut 10. So I've got, you know, I've got some some stuff that I want to take out. I, I've got some hiss. I've got literally mm. echo. So you're like you're in a big room, and uh, you know, and things are echoing around, and it'll it will re not maybe completely reduce, but very much, uh, you know, not completely eliminate, but but very much um, get rid of much of the reverb that you have in the room, and the analyzation wow. is pretty is pretty nifty, and it so, works. Wow. Yeah, it, it works. It works. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So, um, you know, so it, 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 it's, it's really good at, at, you know, going through there and finding stuff. So, you know, removing some of the, the uh, again, some of the hiss, uh, room noise, re reverb, all of those things are things that you can, that it really gives you some, some heavy surgery much over top of what uh, you can normally do. You can see how, where you can select. And some of this stuff, you know, is available in other applications like Adobe Audition and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that but, spectrum view I've used to re eliminate yeah. buzz and stuff in, uh, in a, a Audition. Simil yeah, it's absolutely. similar to that. It's, it, well, it can be, but the match audio, the reverb, and what I mostly use is the is the um, noise removal and the reverb reduction um, are the two things that I'm really, uh, but but there's a lot of tools in here that are, you know, and it's, it, it does feel a little silly to spend three times as much on a, on one set of plugins than you did on the application. Yeah. It's a thousand dollars. thousand A thousand dollars, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's three times more than Final Cut itself, and, and, right. and, um, but it's a very specialized tool, and if, if you find that, you know, you have recordings and you're trying to figure out a way to solve this, um, you know, uh, you know, this is a pretty, pretty awesome collection of tools. Um, they make a lot of different collections. Those, that's, this is the only one that I have or yeah. use currently. Does this work but, with um, Logic too? Yes. Okay. Yes, it, it, it'll, it's, a, it's, it's a standard, I believe it's a, you know, whatever the VST. Right. You know, Plugins. Yeah. For, you know, yeah. Plugin format. So, so it'll do, um, it'll, it'll work in all of those, any application that'll see those things. And so, um, as I said, what I'm primarily, uh, what I'm primarily working on is, is in Final Cut 10 to clean up videos that we've shot. And uh, so I, um, anyway, so, so there's a thousand dollar version and a three hundred dollar version. Do you need the master version? I mean, uh, you know, I you know you if, if, you, it, if totally. you're just getting started, I have to admit that that uh, I got the the advanced one um, right. because I, the, it's the reverb stuff that I was the, the removing reverb, which which mm -hmm. is the primary reason I got into it, and so that's part of the advanced solution. Got it. So um, you know, and so the uh, that's that's why I ended up with that. But there's. Um, there's a lot of great tools in the basic one, but what I needed specifically needed the advanced one. Yeah, and I see you might want to look at the bundles too, because if you do like those Isotope pro pro products, and I've used a number of their uh, plugins, you might want to get the whole bundle. Yeah, they make a lot of pretty amazing tools, and again, yeah. these are these are not tools for necessarily for the hobbyist, unless you're a really yeah, but a crazy podcaster. Might one. Use. I mean, there's... exactly, exactly. Boy, I'll tell you're a you, podcaster... that we had some in the early days when I was doing the audio on, on these shows. There, there were some really horrible problems. Yeah. And, yes. And it was nice I to have these tools. Yeah. 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 And... It's, it's nice. It's nice to have a problem that can be solved by saying, "Well, if I pay this amount of money, I never have to deal with this problem ever again." <laughs> right. <laughs> or, or that you have you you just have a scalpel that you can really you know use for it. You know, a, right. a lot of times, you know, that it's not that the tools that are built into these apps aren't great but th th these are people that this is all they're working on you know is is trying is figuring this stuff out and it, it, it really um you know i know a lot of people that swear by ozone for instance you yeah. know ozone you know to to do a lot of the use those the stuff that they yep. and so so these are um you know pretty amazing 
uh, you know, solutions for, you know, from a highly specialized. And what's great is it's working inside of the application that you already are using. You know, you're yeah, not, right. you're not having to pass it out to another application and then work on it. You just open it up and start and start, you know, cooking through it. And, um, you know, again, if I know that I've, I was just talking to my sister about um, my sister. I think is going to get into doing some podcasting, and and um, uh, and we were talking about it. That, that there's some podcasts out there that she really liked to listen to, but the audio quality was so yeah, bad she just couldn't keep on listening. Yeah. You know, and 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 if you're t- going to try to turn this into a business, you know, the audio has to be the audio is more important, I think, in podcasting and webcasting than than video. You know, it's you know you can deal with bad video pretty often. That's why a lot of these you know, lip dubs and everything else do really well is because the audio is great. It's already pre-recorded, and the video can be whatever it is because, you know, we'll, we'll give video a lot more room than we'll give audio to, to work. I agree. I agree. I-Z-O-T-O-P-E, isotope.com, R-X-4. Uh, yeah, it looks cool. I, I, can I fix clipping? That's all I want to know. Can I fix clipping? I know. <laughs> it does. No. It does. It does has it? some great clipping. Yeah, it has some great clipping. Oh, all right. Um, uh, fixes it built into it. Yeah, look at this non-destructive clip gain, declip, it, declick. It it it, uh, it does that, and I believe it has an, an a deesser as well that that works yeah. pretty well. Um, well, wow. which you know, nice. when you have a lot of those really those those s's that really jump out I think at you. We should get this, uh, Jason Howell, for our editors because we do use Final Cut. I think if we had at least one uh, one license in house, yeah, it'd be a good idea. Yeah, it, yeah. If you have it's one problem, of those tools that you, you hope over. never to need yeah. to use, but if you yeah. need to, having it would be handy. Speaking of which, Jason, have you tried the new Logic 10? Just came out last week. I haven't. It's been a long time since I spent a significant amount of time with Logic. To be honest, I'm pretty much firmly in the Pro Tools camp. Ah. Uh, I used to used to work with Logic, and I liked it. it. Just and this was before it it became kind of Appleized um, when it was a separate product from Apple's catalog, and then they bought it. Uh, it was just overly complicated for me. And a I lot just, of people said, "No, I'm not." Now, a logic, now it's different. Yeah, it's I'm not a Logic now. user, but uh, a lot of people I know, including my son, love Logic, and um, the new the new Logic is apparently a lot easier to use uh, and has some really nice new features and great new sounds. So, Jason logic Snell uses it. Dave Wiskus uses it. A yeah. lot of podcasters use it. Yeah. yeah. It's really good for MIDI. If if you're into yes. MIDI instruments and everything, like it's, loop, it's MIDI loop editing machine. capabilities yep. are yep. are top notch. That's kind of what uh, that's what uh, Henry uses it for. He has a MIDI a MIDI keyboard and he'll he'll do beats and you know, mm-hmm. it's pretty cool what you can do. Um, let's see, Andy Anako, your pick of the week. Uh, speaking of tools that you hope you never have to use, but you're glad to have the times you need to use them. Of course, I have a few weather emergency related <laughs> picks this week. Um, this is one of the, something I bought like like three or four years ago that, oh my goodness, am I, am I glad I have it. This is Eaton's, uh, a company called Eaton has a line of emergency radios, for the FRX line. This is the FRX3. And this is something you buy it during good weather. You put it in a closet, you put it in a shelf, you forget you have it. And then when you do have a weather emergency where you lose power, well, guess what? Now you have a radio uh, that has all the weather bands on it. You can power it off of AAA batteries. When the ba- AAA, If the AAA batteries don't work, it also has a rechargeable battery that, of course, you plugged it in and charged it beforehand. Uh, if you forgot to do that, too, you have a hand crank, so you can charge it up just like this. And if you don't want to do this, you can just use the solar cell and leave it outside, and it will charge up uh, the radio. Uh, and not only that, but it also has... Uh, do I have it on the back here? Uh, it also has a USB port on the back of it so that you can also use any of these charging methods to recharge your phone uh, when you need it. Uh, and they're tied there. Uh, fortunately, we uh, the blizzard wasn't as bad as it uh, as the worst case scenario. Didn't even lose power here today. But uh, this was definitely something that is always somewhere where I can get it because it's also a flashlight. It's also an emergency light. Uh, it's like there. I haven't. I've had had times where the power is out for like days at a time. Worst case scenario, and that's when like especially after the the cell tower backup battery a couple blocks away dies out, and now you have no source of any information except for radio that is uh, that is focused on emergency uh, sort of information. Uh, so this, these aren't that expensive. The cheapest one they make is about 30 bucks. They have a version that's a couple of generations past this now that's about uh, 80 or 90 bucks. That has a much bigger battery. It can actually recharge your tablet uh, and stuff like that. But imagine, this, this is why you have kids. Like you, you wanna you, you, you want to send some text messages. So you just have your kids sitting in the corner like this, churning butter for a good like uh, 20 minutes uh, to charge it up. Just such a good thing just to, just to have uh, standing by. Again, buy it. 
forget that you have it until, oh my God, thank God I have that. I bought that two or three years ago. Uh, and the second and last thing I want to recommend is uh, weather apps. There are like a million of them. So few of them are any good because you have a very peculiar need for information in, especially in a weather situation. My favorite is an app called Bright Weather because they have the best combination of I just want a quick answer. Do I need to, I, I'm planning to go into town or do something on Thursday. Is the weather going to be nice on Thursday? Do I need to bring an umbrella? And it will quickly give you an answer to that. So lots of apps will give you the, here's a happy sunny icon with a cloud behind it that instantly tells you what you want to do. But then there are times you really want to have that deep dive. Look, okay, so you're telling me there's a, there's a storm. Clearly explain to me what's going to happen. Is this going to be a don't make plans day? Is this going to be a you're okay so long as the streets are cleared by 5 p.m.? Or is this really a go down and buy, throw some elbows and buy bottled water and uh, and canned goods sort of thing? Uh, the other the, the other good thing to have is whatever your local news weather app is. Almost every major city, like the, your the network affiliate, will have like a weather app. Uh, here in New England, my favorite is uh, New England Cable News NECN because I still think that if you want to get the full picture of weather in a short amount of time, you will never do better than the two minute long explanation that a weather for, or that a weather meteorologist on TV will give you because they're the people who will again they don't waste your time they say here's what's going here's what the weather's going to be for the next two days here's something that we're looking out for if there's really bad weather coming they will explain to you here's how bad it's going to be and when it's going to be really really bad and also things like and we've all we've got noticed that 995 or 101 is going to be shut down uh, starting for 2 p.m. and they're going to start towing people off of the highway uh, starting at 8 p.m. onward that's not that I don't think that I've seen any app that is as efficient at giving you in two minutes here's a complete picture of what's going on as the weather app uh, that pr produced by your local TV station that will just do nothing but stream whatever the local forecast is. So there you are, disaster preparedness from the planet Hoth with Andy. Be prepared. And <laughs> Be prepared. Uh, my uh, pick, real quick. I've got the princess. We're kind of sealed off here. I'll get her. Out, I'll get her out in the Falcon. <laughs> I have two picks. The folks who created Opera uh, have created a new browser. This is not from Opera, as you know. Opera was sold. <coughs> called Vivaldi, an opera-like uh, browser for, for pros. Um, it's intriguing. It's in beta. Uh, and gosh knows, we really don't need... We've got Safari and Chrome and Firefox. And Spartan now, too. Is is um, Microsoft <laughs> Spartan going to be on, on a Macintosh? No. No, but I, but I mean, in general, it's, it's interesting we're getting browser engines again. It was, yeah. it was a dearth of browser engines for a long yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that might be worth looking at, Vivaldi.com. And there's a new podcast app called Signal that I think is interesting. And again, another category that's probably overrepresented. Uh, <coughs> Overcast, Marco Arment's podcast app is kind of the perfect podcast app. But this one's kind of interesting. Some interesting uh, features that I, I, I think might be useful. For instance, uh, you can, as you're listening to a show, put in a take action cue, uh, an in-show action item. That will say, "Hey, this this was good. It's more than a bookmark." <clears throat> I wish it. I frankly wish it had more of our. Well, it has a pretty good list of our shows. Uh, once you've got your shows uh, in here, uh, it makes it very easy to listen to them. You just press the play button, and it will uh, kind of play the next thing you've got there. Uh, it has social media integration. I like that, so you can post your favorite podcasts. <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, there's a marketplace makes it easy to find them. This is it's an iPhone app, so I'm showing you for for purposes of big screenage on the iPad. But it's kind of nice. Just came out. It's called Signal, and has some uh, has some nice features worth worth looking at. It's free, uh, and uh, you know I'm a fan of podcast apps. I gotta say, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this show. I know all of you must now go out and shovel your sidewalk, so we'll let you do that. Uh, Renee Ritchie doesn't bother shoveling his sidewalks. He just uh, he just hunkers down for the winter. Got Apple earnings to shovel, Leo. I have no time for sidewalks. Coming up soon. I know you're yeah. all gonna have to run and do those Apple earnings. We'll re we'll kind of give you the the lowdown next week, but uh, but watch iMore.com. They'll Apple's have gotta shovel out. They got to shovel out money. Money. They're stuck in the office. They got too much money. A blizzard of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and a uh, uh, cheap plug for those who enjoyed it. We have the final part of the Don Melton and oh. Ganatra saga up on 
on uh, Debug this week, and it was a slobber knocker. That's not a cheap plug. That is a great show that you must subscribe to. Debug at uh, imore.com. They tackle the software stability thing, and uh, they, ah, they don't miss words. Yeah. Very good, insightful, useful stuff. Thank you, Renee. Renee, imore.com. Renee Ritchie from Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. You could fly a drone right off that thing, and man, you'd be in the Potomac before you know it. It's uh, exactly. Alex Lindsay, <laughs> pixelcore.com. Exactly. Uh, anything you want to plug, Alex? Um, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'll be uh, probably tweeting some stuff. I'm, I'll be in Rome tomorrow, so um, so I'm off. I'm off again. So uh, out of here. Um, my, my, I've done enough damage for uh, for one week. What here a jet in, setter! In, in Pittsburgh yesterday, DC today, Rome tomorrow. That's uh, that's kind of the the lifestyle that I'm trying to somehow grow out of, but I haven't quite made it. You doing um, anything with the Vatican? You're going to be out there with the Padre uh, up to no good? No, no comment. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, but I, I will say that there was a great um, YouTube event last week uh, in the White House that people ought to check out, an uh, interview nice with Obama. Nice job on that one. That was, so anyway, that, that was something we, we just won't say anything more about that. But, uh, yeah. it, was <laughs> but it was amazingly yeah, it well perfect. produced. Let's just put Thank it you. that way. Thank you. Thank so you. anyway, so so anyway, but that uh, but uh, anyway, so I'm I'm off and uh, I'll be I'll be coming into Mac break, but from uh, from a hotel in, really? uh, in Italy. You could join us yeah. from Rome. I awesome. Just want you, you know, I want you to know, I spent an hour and a half to find a hotel that said that promised that they had Ethernet in the room, Ooh. and that is no small thing in in Rome. So I did Ooh. did it just for you, Leo. Italian so nice. internet. Yes, we'll see how the Italian internet works. Yeah, exactly. So. We'll be visiting. Whoops, whoops, the snow. The snow got to the end of its... Uh, we had to, no, we look, to, look away, nothing to see look here. Look away, look nothing, away. Nothing to see here. There we go, there we go. It's a good I hate it when that happens. We're paying licensing fees. <laughs> Andy Anako, Chicago Sun-Times. It is darkening, even though it's only 4 o'clock in the East Coast. That seems to yeah, me that maybe and, uh, you're going to get... You know why, you know, I know why I usually have like a blackout curtain in front of this. It's nice. It would be nice to have this lovely back Backdrop, but yeah, I like it. I no, I I think it's beautiful. I love it. The giant, the giant day bowl. I, even so, actually, I have this like taffeta thing because I can't afford to get that sort of. <laughs> you're, you're supposed to like buy film to put over windows to make them like more photo whatever worthy, and it's like, or I could spend like eight dollars for these chintzy curtains. <laughs> <laughs> I think it looks good. Chicago Sun Times, CWOB.com. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Leo. Catch him on his uh, Nako's Almanac, also on the 5 by 5 podcast network. You can catch this show each and every week, 11 a.m. Pacific on Tuesdays. That's 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC on uh, Twit TV. You can watch live if you don't want to or you can't. On-demand versions available online at twit.tv slash mbw or wherever you get your podcasts, podcast app on your mobile. The Twit app on your mobile. We've got Twit apps on iOS, Android. Windows Phone, Roku. We didn't do them. Can't take credit. Great third-party developers who just said, you know what, I think there should be a Twit app. And uh, we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, that's about it. Time to get back to work because you know what? Break time's over. Break time's over.